we'd like to follow you through that procedure.
what channel? On YouTube. Uh, oh, on YouTube? Yep, okay. It's the hometown channel.
short questions and answers are always encouraged as well. So we can, we like to run through, if possible, in three sets with the, with the panelists. Uh, I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves so we can get started. So, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she wanted Jennifer, to be first. Jennifer and I have worked together, so she's gonna be good at covering for me. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Helmer. I've lived in Key West for 24 years. Um, I, uh, many of you know me from the Tropic Cinema, which is uh, now in Whitman, uh, and, and, and uh, I serve on the board of the, the Miami and the Chapter of the Red Cross Board of Directors, uh, Art and Public Places for Key West, uh, and Citizen uh, Editorial Board, and um, the Board of SOS Foundation. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Wolsey-Rousseau, and this is, um, I don't know how many times I've done this, several times now, but uh, I've been a Keys resident for over 10 years, I'm the local attorney, um, and also a business owner, we own a business on Wall Street, over Wall Street called Green Pineapple, and I um, have a lot of different interests, but I serve on that also with Matthew on the editorial board of the U.S. Citizen, and also in several um, organizations in town. Bill Becker, a news director at U.S. One Radio. I've been doing that since 1980. I'm the host of U.S. One Radio's Morning Magazine. And uh, happy to be here. I'm Nancy Klingener. I'm a Florida Keys reporter for WLRN, the public radio station that's based in Miami. And um, I've been in the Keys for 27 years, um, former print reporter for the Miami Herald, Citizen, Solaris Hill, etc. So those are our panelists. Uh, we are streaming live tonight, and our, our website is hometownkeywest.com, so you can text that out to people if they want to see it. Uh, feel free to let me know. If, if, you're, if you're watching, let us know, and we'll call you out from whatever state you're in. I know at the last one, the county manager and the city manager were both watching. But it says right now we've got eight people in view. Let's get right to it, and then as we usually do, we'll take little breaks along the way, but very little breaks as we search for. Okay, we have two candidates for Keys Energy Seat D. These were the two top vote getters. I'll let them introduce themselves in 30 seconds or less. Or less is a big thing tonight. So. Robert, you want to start off? My name's Robert Barrios. I'm a lifelong resident of the Keys. I live in Big Copper Keys since 1995. I worked at Keys Energy for 20 and a half years. I worked my way up from the bottom meter reader all the way up to the safety and risk officer. And I'm here to promote and improve employee and public safety, our, our reliability, and also I would like to um, improve on our renewable energies. Um, please vote for me, Robert Barrios. Hi, I'm Beth Francis and I'm running for the Key West Utility Board because I care about your cost, our community, and conservation of our keys. For more than 10 years now, when the time came to show up and do the work on our county's local utility and conservation policies, I was the only one there. With a proven record of community involvement, you can believe me when I say to you that I will work towards better conservation, lowering customer costs, because I am the only utility board candidate who has been advocating for our community. There you go. Right. Matthew. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, great. Thank you. Beth, I'm going to start with Robert, uh, just because I've got this now, Beth, the lawyer. Uh, Robert, um, according to your hometown bio sketch, you worked for Keys Energy for 28 years. That gives you a lot of experience, but on the other hand, do you anticipate conflict of interest perception? Are you concerned about insider trading, tr insider trading uh, uh, understandings from some of your voters? No, I don't. Um, I think that the time there, I, I've seen what works and what doesn't work. Um, I was part of the improvements over the years. When we were starting out, we didn't have a very reliable system. I seen all the I was part of the improvements, um, the storm hardening project that was um, came about in 2000, 
for 2005 hurricane season if we haven't amended it in 2007. Uh, I encouraged and I was running that program and I started out in Big, Big Pine Key. I said that was a, the area that was neglected over the years and I figured that was the best place to start. We started out in Big Pine and worked our way down to a head to Key West. Um, so I think I know what's, what works and what doesn't. So. Let me rephrase it a little bit. Uh, I'm convinced of your experience, and that's great. Once again, is there any concern about policy crossover of what you did as an employee for Keys Energy and what you will do on the board? I, I, I guess that's it. Yes, I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think there's five board members. I think I'm just one vote. Um, I think I look at both sides of everything before it comes. I'm going to be a, make an educated um, vote on that. Did I answer your question? Thanks. This will be for Beth. Thank you. We live on an island in the Sunshine State, yet we have Keys Energy generates surprisingly little of our power, power from solar energy. In fact, it even entered into an agreement with, all, with our bulk energy supplier that severely restricts our ability to produce solar power for many decades into the future. Since we have ample access to this clean and sustainable resource called the sun, do you believe Keys Energy should be doing more to transition to solar power? I believe uh, solar is the future for renewable energy. I think there's a lot of new solar technology that's coming up. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we have to keep looking at it, and I think we have to keep making wise investments. I'm very, uh, I like the investment we did with the municipal uh, power agencies, the 900,000 uh, solar panels in the middle of the state for the very hurricane-prone area here. They are a part of the solar project that's more protective and a less corrosive environment. Um, I also think that right now, as we're waiting for the money back from FEMA, and we are looking at $45 million approximately, and we've had to make some hard decisions on the budget as far as our keys has, as far as taking out a line of credit and the high interest rate that we're be paying on that, that we have to look at what's coming up in two piles, wants, needs. And so we see this money back from FEMA, and we know our utility is, thank you, our utility is assured financial stability. $45 million is a lot of money. We have to be very careful where we put the money right now to make sure that we watch out for the customer. Robert, um, during your time at Keys Energy, what was your biggest disappointment with the utility? <coughs> I would have to say um, we downsized um, quite a bit over the years. When I first started there, we had 247 employees. We're down to probably 130. So we're doing a lot more with less. Um, so seeing a lot of old timers leave, and um, the way that they came about was more through attrition. Um, but that, I don't think that was a disappointment. It was more like a, you know, a, a way of seeing change over over time. So I mean things change and we've made the improvements um, and those jobs have, have, have come and, and changed and morphed and, and, and it's hard. Would you reinstate some of those jobs? I think that where we got rid of our generation, most of our generation, those jobs went away. Um, some of the jobs, I think we're down to a bare minimum. Um, there, there are some jobs that probably need to be, they just replaced my position um, as a safety and risk officer. And I retired in 2016, December. So it's been a year and nine months. So I think the succession plan needs to change. This question is for both of you. Um, does the utility need a full-time staff attorney, and is there an issue with giving that job to a relative of a board member? No. Um, I don't think there's a need for a second attorney, and I don't think there's um, a need to have 
that position, like that's another one of the jobs that wasn't replaced right away. Um, so bad timing, it smells bad, it looks bad, that's all I have to say. Uh, for the same reason there are no doctors on our hospital board, the public doesn't need utility board members who might be inclined to watch out for their own. The public deserves utility board members who are unbiased and will watch out for them. If I might expand on this, I left several messages for the Keys Energy local union trying to present to them. They would not even allow me the opportunity to meet with them. They chose to endorse one of their own. Uh, this is a question for, for Beth, but Nan, thank you for answer, asking the hard questions. Uh, you mentioned our vulnerable infrastructure. How can we burden our infrastructure for storms best? Is burying overhead cables by the light? That's one of those six half dozen things. There's good arguments for and against on each. The, the big problem of burying underneath is it's usually four to five times more expensive. It also actually does a lot more environmental damage. We are on a different island where we've got fill in some place, we've got coral rock and others, it doesn't always work. Then becomes the problem if there is an issue getting to it. Ahead of the line fair or a transformer blows, we can just send the bucket truck out. If it's underground, we're digging things up. It's going to take a lot longer to restore power. You may have a little more potential uh, hardening and strengthening through the storm, but when something does go wrong, it's harder, more expensive, and longer to repair it. This is a follow-up on Nan's previous question. Um, if you're elected, would you pledge to support uh, and, and to foster a, um, the Keys Energy adopting the anti-nepotism policy? Yes. There is a nepotism policy in place already. As, and I think it's followed in most cases. There's a lot of good people that were turned down for jobs because they had um, family members in leadership roles in this position, so it's in place right now. I think it should be, you know, uh, administered better. You don't support any changes to that policy based on the current situation? Oh yeah, it, it should be made clearer um, that the policy needs to be enforced. Beth, you were involved in one of the most contentious issues come before the utility board, the electrification of no name key. Uh, how do you think that's going to stand you with the board and with the uh, management of Keys Energy? Also, what role did that play in having you run for the uh, utility board and would you have done things differently? Thank you. Uh, the no name key electricity situation, I chose to take a positive approach with it. I made more friends than enemies on one of the most contentious situations that the county has faced. And I feel good about the way it played out at the end. I've had the opportunity to work with FWC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the county, almost every single department, the legal department, the county biologist, actually the aqueduct authority, the BOCC, and the Public Service Commission. I think I bring all of that to this job. Um, I think Noni Key was tremendous. We were the largest untapped solar farm in the state. We're now connected to the grid. Grid tie is happening more and more. My dear friend Kathy is sitting right here. She's got one of the largest solar systems on the island. We took my 2.5 kilowatts, added it to her 2.5 kilowatts, and we've got a 5 kilowatt system that's grid tied right now. I wouldn't change a thing. I'm very happy for the, the, the knowledge and the experience that I've learned. And it made me go forward. I spent the next 10 years, I attended over 300 meetings addressing our local utility and conservation issues, updating the county's comp plan, writing the land development code. All of this brings to the board and I, the community involvement. I spent hundreds of meetings just through the community, from our business events to charity events, from Big Pine to Thank You, Keyway. 
Robert, um, this will be the first time somebody from outside of the city of Key West will be serving on the utility board. What, what position and what responsibility does that carry? Well, first off, I think it's long overdue that they had this position created. Um, the whole time I worked there, I couldn't vote for my board members, so I felt kind of left out. Um, but it's not just the keys, it's everybody um, that gets an electric bill who I'm going to be representing. Um, I think everybody has a voice and should be heard. And knowing all the different keys from my time there, working on Big Pine, Cudjo, Sugarloaf, you name it, I know all of the different um, needs. I, going back to when we started the Storm Hardening project, and we start, I started out in Big Pine Key, I brought a lot of cleanup issues to make it more reliable. We had a lot of, we had a Delta system up there, so we had extra wires that could potentially fall down and cause outages, so we removed some of those wires that didn't need to be up there, so we streamlined the process while they were, while we were replacing the poles. So I think it's the added um, responsibility for that, knowing what the customers in that area needs. We have a couple minutes left, and they got some Short questions that have relatively short answers. <laughs> Give it a shot. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Beth, you mentioned FEMA, and I'm going to be asking some questions about FEMA today. We are getting signals from Washington, as we get signals from Washington, that uh, the role of FEMA in natural disasters is going to change. Um, meaning to me that we can depend less upon FEMA for help with uh, catastrophic weather events like Irma. Um, how does your board deal with those with that new uh, board. Okay, the board actually just started the policy in the last board meeting. They're going to start putting $1.2 million per year in the hurricane fund. Um, I've been attending these Keys Energy board meetings for two years, so that's something I'm trying to stay up on, on the policy making of the board. And I'd like to actually follow up on Nancy's earlier question. Well, can we, I, we're trying to keep okay. it tight, so. <laughs> Robert, quick. Yes, um, I was at those board meetings too. They're, they're making the changes for the um, upcoming um, hurricane season, and I think it needs to be even we need to be less reliant on them, but it's kind of hard. If we went so many years without a storm, that you, know, you can't just keep tying up money for you know, a rainy day. But I think what they're doing is, is a good step in the right direction. Thank you, guys. about it being too cold in the room. So <laughs> this time we're going to make sure that it's warm. So you know, until the AC is, is going and it might be too hot. I was quite worried. Obviously, you see our sound has gotten worked out. Part of that's because, as always, we have Kelly from AV in Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> she's very much, but can you imagine fighting that all night, the feedback and stuff that she's got? So, moving on. Guys, why don't you introduce yourselves? Why don't we start on the other side? Phil, can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Phil Goodman. I'm the current commissioner of District 2. Uh, in my second term, I have also been fortunate to have been elected chairman for the past three years. I'm a chemist, I have an MBA degree, a private sector businessman. I'm running on my record as a physical conservative, one who's helped transform mosquito control into a really technology-based science. I think our results speak for itself, and uh, we've kept this community uh, safe. Thank you. Ralph? Uh, I'm Ralph Palmer, with a lot of people you know, people Keys building as a photographer, but I used to work for uh, Florida Keys Mosquito Control District for 2001 to 2014. Uh, I've lived in Florida all my adult life, 
Miami, Cape Canaveral, worked on the Space Shuttle Program, and been in the Keys since 2001. Uh, with Mosquito Control, I installed the first data systems, the first network from Key Largo to Key West, and installed the first database, the first aerial tracking systems, the first uh, mosquito truck tracking systems. Uh, all of our inspections are tracked, and uh, we built quite a bit of the technology. Thank you, Rob. We're going to go to Mr. Helmick. We're, we're still working on the whole short question, long question. <laughs> It's going to be a long night. <laughs> yes. uh, he dresses well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, I have a question for you. Um, I have to confess, I was under the impression that the Mosquito Board was a pretty tranquil group. In October 2016, you wrote a local, locally published essay making accusations of partisanship and mismanagement on the Mosquito Control Board. Is this a board you feel you can work with? What improvements can you make? And if you want me to remind you about this article, um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's my question. Yeah, uh, the board has been going through a lot of issues. I mean, the, uh, from uh, uh, the retirement of our director in 2011 until now, uh, we've made a lot of changes in the budgeting. Most of the arguments have been about budgeting, GMO mosquitoes. Uh, been a lot of contentious issues on the board. I, I believe I can work with all the members. I believe I've got enough experience to, uh, with those issues, to work with all the board members. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't think I accused anybody of uh, any impropriety. And I'm not suggesting that you did. It was a, uh, you know, it was a rabble rousing article. And I'll. Well, I get a little passionate about it. <laughs> I've been working there on uh, 13 years. I've, I've got a lot of friends there. So I have ever had to have uh, sheriff's deputies at the Mosquito Control Board meetings. Yeah, we never had to have that. <laughs> Maybe with the baby carriers, and the three deputies told me that they had the SWAT team up on the roof. <laughs> Those babies can get out of control. <laughs> this question will be for Phil. Um, you've been a champion of GM mosquitoes, and now we hear reports from the Cayman Islands and other places that um, where GM mosquito programs have been implemented that have shown that the cost of such programs are quite high. So my question is, have we, before we go through all of this effort, I know that we're going through the USDA, USDA now, uh, determine whether or not they can be released in the Keys. And we, I've never seen a calculation of the cost if we were to implement a GM mosquito program countywide. What would be the cost of that per capita and how does that compare with the cost of the methods we're using now? Okay. It works 30% to something that may work 100%. It's hard to come up with, you know, with an exact cost comparison. However, uh, in the Cayman Islands, they just recently uh, gave a contract to uh, Oxitec to run extended uh, trials there, and, uh, and they're actually paying for it. Now, what uh, Oxitec has done here, they have guaranteed us that, you know, for the first five years that we would use this, which in five years, if, if we get to use this and it works like we, we think it may, uh, you know, the, uh, the cost would be no more than what we're paying right now. And we're paying about $1.2, $1.5 million a year right now in Key West to try and control any subject by mosquito. We're only doing about 30 to 50% of the, of the job. So, you know, I think uh, based on what Oxitec said that they will allow us to, uh, to do this, and it's a special case for the Keats, you know, because they, they want to get this going in the U.S., and, but we're all waiting now to see what the uh, EPA says. But they haven't given us a, a specific cost no, for the program? There, there is no cost because right now it's an experimental use permit of the EPA, and the EPA is not, will not allow Oxitec to discuss any pricing at all. It has to wait till it's a commercialized product. So that in the Wabakia, there's been no cost discussions at all by anyone. Uh, however, you know, when you're, you know, it's in a production, when you're producing mosquitoes and the that can produce millions of them, the more you produce, the less you're going to have very low. So we, we think it's going to be very competitive.
trained them up and, and got back into the same mode or similar mode. But uh, I think they just, they just, and they're into the bone of the operation. Uh, for example, uh, we used to have uh, $8 million worth of reserves. And, uh, next year's projected budget reserves are 2.3 million. They've used those reserves for uh, general operations, basically. Uh, and the board acted surprised in 2016 when they didn't have any money to build a facility on the big comet. They had to raise taxes, 23% to build half the facility. So there's been, in my opinion, some serious fiscal mismanagement of the general budget. To 15, uh, we were 15 percent uh, with the low rollback last year. That was two years ago that we had the 21 percent. So we, we rolled it back. We were 15 percent below rollback last year because we still had a, a, a little bit of completion to do on that project last year. You know, and uh, so uh, and this year we are 3.48 percent above rollback because we are we're really having to now replace our aging fleet of aircraft. These were scheduled to be start replacing five years from now, but we got a new maintenance team in uh, that looked at it, and uh, they said that you know because of the local corrosion and unscheduled maintenance, high cost that we're going to be facing, we need to start replacing it. But you know this is also a debarmaking operation. These these helicopters that we're getting, we're going to replace two helicopters and probably additionally two airplanes with these. They're twice the more than twice the capacity and range. Uh, you know, one of our problems is we have a very narrow window when we can treat for mosquitoes. So going up and coming down to putting new chemicals or reloading chemicals really is time set, uh, time waster. This will allow us to have more than twice the range and put out twice the uh, uh, number of amounts of chemicals for a wide range so that we can really get better coverage, more economical coverage than we're having now. This question is for Ralph. Um, we know you oppose the use of GMO mosquitoes. Uh, how do you feel about the use of the daylight, the adult aside for a use of your time? I only seem to get the daylight question. You know? it's, uh, <laughs> but it's it's a very nasty chemical that we use very judiciously, and there's it's been used in the Keys for three decades, and there's no real replacement for it right now. As soon as we can replace it, we should replace it. But uh, uh, it's, it's just one of those things, we're down to a quarter an ounce per acre uh, spraying from, from airplanes uh, with daylight. We notify beekeepers, we notify everybody else when we spray to try to limit the, the um, impact. But daylight is just one of those chemicals we try to get away from. We used to spray daylight uh, 33 times average season of the big pine. Uh, right now we spray daylight there about three or four times. So we've reduced it by going to larval side, which is a much more friendly, uh, environmentally friendly bacteria, basically, is found, found naturally in soil. And that's reduced our adult side uh, just, uh, tremendously. And the adult side is expensive, so it, it reduced the type of, uh, the use of mailing, but it also reduced the cost. The first 10 years, we, we went to BTI, we saved the taxpayer 1.5 million, or $15 million, $1.5 million a year, uh, just in the chemical budget. So uh, we're, we're trying to get away from that, but it's impossible to stop using it. We have time for one more round. Again, quick, quick answers are better than long answers and questions. See Matthew after Nan asked the question, then you'll be next. I was unclear on how many grounds. I have a quick one. Okay, but we will go out of here. I've always thought it was so weird that this is a partisan <laughs> position. Um, do you think that should change? Both of you, yes or no? I, there's nothing more nonpartisan than killing mosquitoes. <laughs> Yeah, 
I'm uh, excuse by Republicans, Democrats, <laughs> and the same. And uh, I, I agree with you. And um, you know, the only I, I think we're the only mosquito control district in the whole state that is partisan. Like the rest of are not partisan, but um, you know, this would require a legislative change. No depth or questions. <laughs> May I? Thank you. Uh, for all of the advances that you're making, we are paying for those. How do you contain budgets while uh, doing your job and killing mosquitoes? That's the question. And I, you know, this, this one is a good question because to me, it's not about raising taxes as first thing. It's about using your money wisely, planning how you're going to use it, and cutting costs and deep bottom necking. This is what we've been doing. We, we've maintained our operational budget since 2012. It's only grown 3%, including this year, uh, in total of all those times. And, and we've done it by really eliminating waste. There was a lot of waste in mosquito control. We've done a lot of eliminating it. Uh, we be sure that people have full-time jobs and they're working. And um, uh, you know, I, I think it's paying off. And we, we also changed the culture of mosquito control for this, too. In our meetings today, you hear people say return on investment, cost-benefit analysis, efficiency, effectiveness, things that you never heard in the past because we really are trying to operate with a lot of good business principles as well. Well, the, the uh, technology improvements are absolutely necessary, but it's a, it's a business that takes both technology and just old-fashioned manpower. You have to be you have to be efficient in your operations. You have to know where to spray, when to spray, uh, how often to spray. Um, we broke Key West in the ten different seven different zones during the dengue outbreak, so that we could eat the elephant a little one piece at a time instead of uh, uh, trying to to find out where the Hades aegypti or where on the overall uh, two by four island. We broke it down to like 1,200 12, uh, houses per inspector so that the inspectors could go there once a month and inspect. And we, there's some side effects of that. Uh, the people actually got to, to meet their, their mosquito control inspectors and get to know them by first name basis. And uh, they were educated about how to, how to not breed mosquitoes that way. So there's, we, I'm a technology guy. I love technology. But there are things that you have to do with people, and you can't get away from it. Uh, we have to be judicious about it. Uh, our, we're not giving them tons of raises. People, people work for the state of control. They, they like their jobs because you know, they're, they're, they're doing something positive for the community, not because they want to become rich. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to cut farther than what we've cut. We've cut down to the basics now. I think these helicopters make sure us uh, a good deal of efficiency. Jim, got a quick one for us? Yeah, this will be for um, for Ralph. Um, so, if, if you're elected, you would obviously be a newcomer on a very well established board. So, what if you give us a couple, two, three fresh ideas that you think you would bring um, to the board in your first year or two? Yeah, the first thing I'd do as a board member is I'd start rebuilding our reserves to where we had money in the bank again, so to speak, for these disasters and outbreaks and diseases. And uh, we had a Cat 3 hurricane, or Cat 4 hurricane last year, that uh, it made landfall 11 miles from where we just put in trailers. Uh, so we, gotta, we, we have to change the direction that we're going. It's just, it's, it seems to be going in the wrong direction right now. And I, I, I'd like to build the reserves, uh, uh, attend to the capital needs like the helicopters, the temporary facility that we have on Big Coppet. Uh, we have to maintain our, our uh, technologies. Everything changes. 18 months in the technology world is a lifetime. So we, we've got to keep up with everything. And, and I know technology, so I can, I can add my expertise to the board. I know most of the board members also, so I think I can work with everybody on the board. Bill, last question. Oh, please, very quick. Phil, were you satisfied with the, the mosquito control's preparation and response to Hurricane Irma? What would you have done differently? Yes, you know, we, we have a plan. We have a really detailed plan, and we've followed through with our plan. We, um, we evacuated our, our, all our aircraft and our people. We came back in the second day. 
We were operational within just a few days, as planned. Uh, we worked several days with the Sheriff's Department. You know, they were using our helicopters for surveillance. But we came, came back in and we started controlling mosquitoes right away. And, um, uh, and you know, in the end, uh, we didn't have to borrow money to keep our operations going like some. You know, we, have a, we had a really good budget. Uh, I know that uh, it's getting criticized by some, but you know, we, we do have reserves. And uh, we, we started out when I got on the board with about $5 million worth of reserves. Uh, at the end of uh, next year, we'll have three million planned, but there'll be some more in there. However, um, you know, we built a building and we built bought helicopters. That's what reserves are for to use. You know, when you need it, it's not just to sit on and uh, you know a, a bag of money to say you've got a lot of money. It's there to be used, and we had used it and we've used it wisely. And I think uh, the results of mosquito control speak for themselves. I think we've done a really good job. Thank you, guys. While they're coming up, I want to recognize uh, Sheldon Davidson. So we've decided to be verbally accepting it, so he's now board member emeritus. for AHEC because I believe in the importance of health care. My passion is children. For 12 years I've been a mentor with the Take Stock in Children program and in 2009 I was hired by the state of Florida to be the guardian ad litem child advocate coordinator representing children who've been abused, abandoned, and neglected. I'm also on DAC 3 of the Tourist Development Council. I am a proud member of Bishop Monroe County and for the past three years, I've sat on Marathon City Council, and this year I am the mayor. I am running because I love Thank our you, community. Michelle. Tommy. Thank you. My name is Tommy Ryan. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. I'm also a retired New York City firefighter. I responded to 9-11 and uh, ended up retiring a couple of years later and moving here to the beautiful Florida Keys. Um, I got involved in this uh, campaign here because of the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. Uh, I live in Big Pine. Big Pine was the hardest hit key, and we literally uh, sat in our own crap for too long. I went to a, a Board of County Commissioners meeting, and I asked the commissioners to all thank you, Tommy. We'll, we'll, you'll have more time to do it this time. Matthew, thirty seconds goes fast. It sure does. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Michelle, I want to put a question to you because you mentioned uh, the TDC. Uh, the VOCC approves all TDC expenditures generated from the bank taxes, most of which go to marketing efforts. The TDC can also spend money on capital improvements for county and not-for-profit infrastructure. In your opinion, should we be spending more on advertising to attract tourists or more on improving the product we're trying to sell? So thank you, that's a very good question. Um, the money from TDC actually it goes marketing, capital, and also events. So there's actually three um, stool legs to that stool, yes, indeed, and they're all correct. And and that makes sense that you would want the most of your money to go towards advertisement, but you don't want to dismiss the importance of bricks and mortar because if you get a person here and they have a bad experience, they're not going to come back and they're going to tell everyone else not to come here. When um, you look at our parks and our beaches and the fact that 
the TDC money can go for that and can help improve the quality of the beaches and the parks. That's not only a benefit for the tourists, but more importantly, it's a benefit for the families that live here. So I, I think it's important that both of those are, are funded and also for the events so that when somebody comes here, they have something they can do instead of just going to work. May, may I follow that up quickly? It's not a binary question. So it doesn't mean stopping advertising or marketing altogether. It means changing the ratio of what we spend on advertising to what we spend on a capital improvement. I believe right now the ratio is working. The, um, the DAC has the ability, if they don't like the ratio, and if they feel that extra money was in capital, they can request that those monies roll over. I believe with the nonprofits and some of the visions that they have and how they want to improve their facilities, it would behoove the DACs to save a little money in the reserves in their capital, which was budgeted for capital, keep it there so that money is available for projects. This will be for Tommy. Uh, it seems like you and many residents of your district uh, often feel like they get the short end of the stick when it comes to the amount of uh, funding and allocation that is going to uh, to the lower keys. So my question is, what specific actions will you take as commissioner to ensure that your district is treated fairly and equally by the BOCC? Well, I would actually recognize the district. Um, <laughs> the second district, but it's all of unincorporated Monroe County that needs a, a, a loud voice. And I think I could be that loud voice. I think that there's there's many things that we need to do. Uh, you just brought up the TDC. Um, I firmly believe that it should be shifted over more to some bricks and mortar, especially after you went through a category four hurricane. There's a lot of places that need some extra building. Um, there was a request to put in a van shelter in uh, Big Pine Key Park. That would have been an incredible boost of morale to the community, and it was turned down. So those are the type of things that we need to work on that should be going on, especially after a Category 4 hurricane hits you. Michelle, the uh, county currently allows higher densities for affordable housing. There's a proposal out there to increase the density in the unincorporated area. Do you support that? So I'm guessing you're talking about Goal 109, which um, in the conception of that started right after the hurricane when the county realized that the workforce housing issue was even larger because so many people lost their homes. And they came up with Goal 109, and one of those issues would be to increase the density, as there was a lot of other topics as well. I would almost say that 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 was a year ago, and they still haven't approved Go 109, so I don't see this urgency in changing the density right now for a goal that hasn't yet even been formalized on paper. Uh, I think it would make sense if you take different areas, almost like an overlay and say in this area it would make sense to have an increase in density because this is where the workforce population is and this is where the work center is. This question is for Tommy. Um, are you concerned that um, because of the issues we had last year after Irma that not as many people will evacuate next time there's an evacuation order? And uh, what do you think, if anything, the county should do about that? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, people, it's a double-sided sword because you have people who stayed who said they will never stay again. And you have people who left who got stuck up in the bottleneck and the upper keys and said that they will never leave again. Um, I chose to stay. I came into Key West and stayed in the Category 5 building. I was uh, taking care of 65 other people and two flamingos. <laughs> and, um, and we were very safe in the Category 5 building, but it was also in Key West, you know, as you tend to forget, it was a Category 1 here. It was not a Category 4. Um, so it is a big concern, to, you know, to get people out of here and, you know, safety, we just saw what went on in North Carolina. Safety is a concern and we need to, you know, take care of our people. There were issues with taking care of people who needed to be brought out of here, who weren't brought out in a timely fashion. So we need a lot of work. I mean, the, the, the storm really brought up uh, issues for us that we need to address. I believe we're starting to address them, um, but we do need to do more. I think the, the uh, um, decals on the windows is a, a, will work, 
and the police officers were up there said that they were the things that were good. Not the little notes saying somebody's name on it, I'm a friend of. <laughs> Michelle, let me put a question to you um, that was kind of asked with Tommy. Your challengers in the Republican primary campaigned on the opinion that District 2 below Marathon is poorly represented by its commissioners. You're currently the mayor of Marathon, but you're still the mayor of Marathon, right? Um, which may appear to make you even more marathon focused and less less involved with the lower keys. How do you deal with that concern? I would say don't judge me by my zip code. Don't judge me by which key in District 2 that I live in, but judge me by my actions. Judge me by what I have already accomplished while living in Monroe County. My work with the Guardian Ad Litem program I was um, the child advocate coordinator for all the children from Marathon through Key West, which is District 2. So I'm very familiar with the district. Look at my actions and how committed I have been to not just Marathon, but the entire county after the hurricane. I took an oath to my city when I was sworn in that I would be there for the residents of my community. I was there two days after the hurricane and was didn't even go to my own home for several weeks doing what I needed to do to be for the representatives that I represented. That's who I am, that's my who, what I'm made of, and that's exactly how I will be when I'm with District 2. I will have an open door policy on Ship's Way on Big Pine. I will attend everyone's neighborhood association meetings and have my phone number is on my business card. It's my cell number. I'm very approachable, and I think that people will find after they see me that they can trust me and that I'm here to listen and to help people with what their concerns are. I'd like to ask this of both the candidates if possible. Um, on Wednesday, the commission will decide the fate of the 300 additional robo allocations being offered by the state to help develop uh, affordable housing projects in the Keys. Do you believe that the county should accept the additional robo allocations? And if so, how should those units be allocated and restricted between the various municipalities? Uh, I don't believe that they should accept them. I think that uh, it's going against the uh, comp plan that the, uh, the county has worked on for years. Um, we have, you know, before the storm, there was still 475 available uh, robo units. And I think that this is was a, a ploy to throw in there from the governor saying, here's the 1,300 robo units and divide them up in the county. And the stipulation that be out, you know, that people will be out of the area within 48 hours. We're trying to get these, these for workforce housing. So if your workforce leaves 48 hours ahead of time, how are you going to enforce that? How are you going to get them out? You know, there's, there's a serious problem with that. And it just, it, it, and I think it's a direct attack on the home rule of the county. To change it, and let's stop the next governor from coming in and saying, "Well, here's 8,000 robos. Be out in 72 hours." So you open up, you open up Pandora's box with that. Michelle. So we're a state of critical concern, and in 2023 we will be in build out, and there will not be any more robos allocated. At that point, the county will be in hopefully a partnership with the state on how we're going to address the thousands of property owners who have a right as a property owner to build but don't have a ROGO. In the city of Marathon, we saw that we had the need for affordable units. So it was our city council that wrote a resolution asking the governor for 300 units because we knew we had the need. We um, were a little surprised when, when he came back and offered 1,300 for the entire county. I, I feel that if you can reword your comp plan and your, your LDR to ensure this, the, the natural resources aren't negatively impacted, to make sure that the infrastructure is in place, the roads and wastewater and stormwater can handle the 300 units, and that there's an evacuation plan in place for those people who are in those units, then I think we could accept the units and put them in the bank. And then, if we find a good project, if the units that we currently have are being used and we see that there's a need, we have those units in the bank. That also helps us against any mitigation 
come 2023, when we asked the state to help us, they could say, well, you didn't take those 300 we offered you earlier, so Thanks, you're Michelle. on your own. Bill. Okay. Um, Michelle, prior to the uh, primary election, the Cuba Citizen recommended a vote for one of your opponents at the time. And I believe the editorial in the Citizen said something to the effect that they questioned your grasp of the issues. How would you respond to them? I have to say I was a little surprised. I feel that um, my involvement in our community and my being sitting on Marathon City Council for the past three years, that I completely understand the issues at hand. Not only that, I have attended the planning commission meetings off and on for the, path, for the county for over the past year. When I knew I was going to run, I started attending all of the county commission meetings. I've attended them from the moment they start until the very bitter end every month, regardless of where they are. And I also sit with the county commissioners in group meetings that we have when it's a multi-disciplinary multi group where we discuss issues such as road safety and ROCO and the environment. So I guess I just better speak a little louder and let people know that I do comprehend the issues at hand. Uh, this is for Tommy. Um, are we adequately enforcing vacation rental rules in the unincorporated areas of the county? And if one month rentals are still fueling the market and keeping housing out of reach for people who work here, how can we address that given that the state does not allow us to regulate them further? Well, we're absolutely not uh, doing enough to uh, address it. Um, it's, it's a huge issue right now. Um, we're losing out on a lot of rental units that people could, you know, our workforce could be using. Um, the county's, uh, you know, trying, you know, different, different uh, programs. They have uh, people working the computer. Um, but when you do anything on the computer, as soon as you institute a program to start investigating it, the new program is out to get around that program. So we need to, we need somehow, um, and there are people in the, you know, where there are well-known people in the town here who are violating the rules. So if they're violating the rules, it rolls downhill. So everybody figures, well, I can make a couple bucks at my house too, why don't I? But it, it's destroying neighborhoods. There's neighborhoods in the upper keys that, you know, they rented out a house now and they, they have a wedding venue there. So every night, practically, there's weddings going on there. So these are the type of things that we don't need in neighborhoods, and we do need to enforce it more. Um, instead of maybe going around to, you know, with code enforcement, busting the chops of the people who lost their homes in the hurricane, maybe we can have them out investigating the Airbnbs. residents back home after storms have passed. How do you propose we resolve this problem? See, Matthew, the lightning. Lightning means lightning. Solve that problem in 15 seconds. So I think this year we did a much better job evacuating the keys. And I believe that the communications of letting people know where gas stations were open along the way helped tremendously. The problem, I believe, was when it was trying to get people back into the Keys that there were issues. The county is doing a great job now with a new placard system and with communicating with residents and with everyone else on how to get people smoothly moved back in after, after a hurricane. I don't know that I'm answering your question because they're telling me time's up. I, thank you. You did great. No. Jennifer, your quick question. Show you how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Term limits for BLCC numbers, yes or no? Yes. Is this for both of us? Yes. yes. 
Would you agree to sponsor a resolution? The yes. one. Sure thing. <laughs> the, the current district two commissioner has an office on Big Pine Key. If elected, where would your office be? Mine would remain right there on Ship's Way in Big Pine with an open door policy. This will be my full time job, so I will be there from probably 10 in the morning until 5, and then I expect to be at neighborhood meetings afterwards and out in the community, and, and not just taking care of the community in District 2, but the whole county. Tommy. Uh, I will also keep it there on Ship's Way that belongs in Big Pine, that needs to be in Big Pine, because I live in Big Pine, and I can my bicycle. <laughs> Here's a yes or no. Uh, single member districts for the county, yes or no? Yes. No. Because five people on a dais make decisions that impact the entire county, and I think you should have the ability to know who you're voting on that will be impacting the entire county. And that's also, that's also why that, uh, nobody that has held the position in the second district has actually won the second district because it goes out to the county and there's blocks of people that are voting and there's people that you know will buy a home to run in the county i'm buying a home i bought my home in big pine i live in big pine i live in the second district and that's why i'm running i'm running because there was a, there's a problem that needs to be addressed and i want to address it thank you guys While our next candidates are coming up, I want to remind the panelists to please turn off their phones. <laughs> and while they're doing that, everybody in the audience please hear that as well. I've heard it before. <laughs> Two Oceans Digital, doing our video as always. And going to be, Winnie. Oh, we got 20 going on right now. So we'll watch it. Hopefully, it's Jim Shaw and I'm going to be Hey, guys. Okay, we're going to get right to it. David, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I'm David Rice. Uh, I moved to the Keys with my wife, Mary, 45 years ago. And I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a doctorate. Uh, I've worked as a police psychologist and a clinical psychologist. Established all the mental health programs outside of the Kansas City of Key West. That time there was very soon nobody there. So, I've been your county commissioner in District 4 for the last, well, let's say 12 years, but it's yet to have a holiday. Um, and I'd like to ask you to support me at the November New Election. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vicki Tashton. I've been a resident since 92, so that would be for about 26 years. I have extensive background in tourism. I've been in that business for 35 years from the ground up to being a certified retail administrator. I have been on your district advisory council, Jack 3, for the past 14. I've been the chair for the past four. And prior to Marathons Incorporation, I was a volunteer fire rescue person. So I think I have a pretty strong background to know what the boots on the ground is in this county. Thank you. Vote for Vicki. Uh, Vicki, a question for you. Second and third homes for part-time residents of the Keys are on the rise. Many of those homes set, sit empty much of the year. They inflate costs of residential real estate, and their owners aren't contributing to the economy or the overall life of Monroe County. Do you call this a problem? If you do, is there a solution? I think it is a bit of a problem um, because, again, we do need workforce housing. Unfortunately, a lot of these people just are hardcore that they don't want to lend anybody in their house if they want the opportunity to let their families come down and they choose. Um, I wish there was a way that we could encourage them to have some type of incentive to, that is their third home particularly, to consider lending that be some type of a housing for someone that is their full time. Thank you. This question will be for David. What are the top two or three environmental challenges that you believe the Keys are currently facing, and what is the County Commission doing about them? Well, that's a big question.
first of all, was Florida Bay, and the more you move toward the Upper Keys, you understand that we are not getting our fresh water out of the Everglades into Florida Bay. We have roughly 50,000 acres of sea bass die off. We have algae issues. We have many issues. Our commercial fishermen there are finding bonefish, which used to be very common up there. You pick and choose where you're going to bonefish up there now because all the old hot spots are there. Uh, that, that is a major issue. We still have a continuing sewer issue. We've remedied that. We spent a billion dollars doing that. However, we have to realize that our total ground cover is saturated with the affluent that we placed there over the last 50 years, let's say. And it's going to be leaching out for many years. Our canal system was not designed for the environment. And many of them capture environmental problems in the canal. It's currently funding projects to clean up the canals after the hurricane, but we're also working canal by canal to clean those canals individually. Uh, Monroe County currently uh, prohibits vacation rentals less than 28 days in residential subdivisions. If the state would allow Monroe County to change that, how would you propose changing that? Is that too good? So if the county was allowed to go less than 28 days. If they were allowed to change it at all, what, what would you, how would you change it? I think the county 28 days is, is good. I don't see any need to make it less, if that's what you're asking me. Um, to make it more, not so much. I, I think we should encourage people that have homes in that situation that could be uh, affordable housing, that we should try to encourage them to go more towards that because that's what we need. If their homes are listed as vacation rentals and they're only running them maybe two months out of the year, they need to look at the map and they may be better off finding the workforce people live in. David, as was mentioned in the last session, at least on paper, we're looking at build out in five years. Um, are we ready? And if not, what should we be doing? Hell no, we're not ready. Uh, we are going to be at build out in 2023. There will be no new permits coming into the county according to the plan. Plan change. We all know that sometimes. But I truly believe there will be no more. We need a partner. We probably are going to, we're going to be trying to buy, with your money and my money, tax money, about 5,000 pieces of property in Monroe County. I would imagine with takings cases, that's going to be in excess of a half a billion dollars on my tax bill and your tax bill, as things currently stand. I think the next four years are the most important four years that I've ever seen here. Because the decisions made to develop a partnership with the state, who should be participating with us on payment of that money, is absolutely essential. We did not make that decision at the level of the county commission. We made it under pressure, and Shirley Freeman over there can tell you about it because she was there when it was happening. We made it under tremendous pressure from the state of Florida. They need and they're working with us to pay for this liability. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the both of you. Uh, there's mounting evidence to suggest that FEMA can no longer be a reliable partner in first response relief or long-term recovery for hurricanes in the Florida Keys. FEMA is financially and logis logistically overextended. How do you propose the county mount recovery efforts, both private and public, with a shaky future for FEMA? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, well, you say FEMA can no longer be. I'm not sure they have been for a while. But in, in any case, we've been very disappointed with FEMA's ability to handle this generalized disaster that we've been hit with in many areas of the country, and it's overwhelming. 
There's no difference between the county and the city control on that question. You build your reserves to where you have sufficient reserve to rely on. However, I'm going to lobby for something real quick that I think is, should be the answer. Why aren't we thinking nationally about a national catastrophic insurance that would cover hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, earthquakes? Everybody in this country has some kind of disaster they live next to or over. Why aren't we taking that approach, spreading the load across everybody in this country? I think it could work, but it's got to be addressed in Washington. I have to concur. I don't think we can rely on FEMA at all. Um, I think they're overextended. They don't know what to do. And uh, we do have to build our reserves, absolutely. Um, uh, a lot of other countries we can learn from that do exactly what uh, Mr. Rice, Commissioner Rice just said. They have national plans and all to help offset these kind of issues. Uh, and we tend to uh, try to march to drummers sometimes that need to uh, be changed. So David mentioned several large projects that we have, um, you know, coming up, cloud, canal clean up, and just everything that we're dealing with. I guess my question, Vicki, will be for you. How, if you're elected, how will you set your priorities on what should come first and what we can wait on um, as, as far as our funding and building up our reserves? What's going to be the most important to you? I, I think that's kind of a double-edged sword. Our housing, obviously, we've got 4% of the workforce that's gone, they said, so far. Um, that's roughly 4,000 people that aren't here to work. We need to find a way to bring them back here. But with that said, we've got to be able to sustain them. We've got to have clean water. We've got to have potable water. Um, for the fishing guides, we've got to work with the Everglades and um, with all the agencies to try to um, get rid of the algae blooms and so forth. I actually right now am a volunteer with the FWC for the Red Tide Project. Um, and I'm testing uh, down here in the case for them and sending the samples in. So uh, we need to continue to be proactive on, on both of those levels. Um, I think maybe we should probably also uh, look exactly how much money and where uh, it goes from what parts of the budget that we add more into the reserves and quickly. That's a good question, I guess, to the previous uh, candidates about goal 109, the affordable housing density. Do you support increasing the current affordable housing density? I love the short answer. No. <laughs> Actually, it works against us. We're moving into an area, I'm going to take a second here that I have. We're moving into an area where there are no good answers. We've got, we've got an answer over here that's not perfect. We've got an answer over here that's not perfect. Yes, we could increase density. Therefore, we would use less land. Therefore, we would have more takings cases in 2023. Takings cases and reserving for takings cases, you want to use up all the land you can. You want to have it developed. For the opposite, moving it into the, the residential areas where the jobs are, that's, that's not using yet. You're building larger projects. It's going to cost us in the long run. We're wrestling with that very issue right now on the county commission because we really haven't established policy to address that adequately. Right. Question to Vicki, uh, goal 109. Do uh, you support that? Uh, no, I, ha I have to say that it, it does become an issue of density and versus the lawsuits that will come with uh, all that land if it's not used and so forth. So, uh, no, I, I think it's a fine line, but as much as we need housing, we've got to be careful with that. We don't want to lose all of our money in lawsuits. Trust me, you will. <laughs> um, somewhat related to that, uh, I'd like to ask each of you if you think the county should um, accept the 300 of the 1,300 new um, units that the state is offering outside of Rogo with the early evacuation requirements. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, yes, I do think we should accept them. Uh, I have to, unfortunately, use the word that Michelle used, but put them in the bank. Um, I, I've said it before, I think we need to take them, we need to sit on them, and you know, if, if we don't use them, we don't use them. But if uh, we need them, and the comp plans and so forth are in place to use them, we should. Marathon's working on it, Key West is working on it, Adam Morano's working on it, and uh, the other 300, and Key Colony, and uh, Lake, I think it is. So uh, the other 300 for the county, yes, we should take those. And let me say that I think we could get it right for where I am as well. Uh, had a thought today. You're, you're looking at the evacuation model. You evacuate a home by home. I wonder if we have 300 first responders who don't have families in this county because they shouldn't count in the evacuation model. Therefore, you could balance out the 300 here with the 300 there. Uh, whether it can really work that way or not, I don't know. It was just something that came up with we'll talk staff about today. We'll explore it, we'll think about it, we'll look at it. But bottom line is those 300 units represent an estimated 60, $600 million that won't be on my tax roll and your tax roll. So there are a lot of good reasons uh, why we take them, we bank them, we use them to prevent lawsuits when we're facing takings cases in later years. We don't have to use them, but if we give them up, we won't ever get them back. And the state is going to be convinced that they've tried to help us, we refuse. Then we go to them and say, you need to pay half this bill. Why, why would they help us? We didn't help ourselves. Thank you. Okay, we got a little bit of time. I think your favorite part of this, the lightning round. Right on. <laughs> this is lightning for me. Yes. Um, <laughs> David, working, working off of your good answer about that there, there is no good answer, we've talked a lot about uh, workforce housing tonight. Voters seem to support uh, low income housing at the same time. There's a strong, strong NIMBY dynamic, like not in my backyard. Many Keys residents don't want workforce housing in their neighborhoods, and they don't support relaxed density or height restrictions. How do you resolve that issue? Well, I think we have enough property in the county that we can do workforce housing. The cities will accept large workforce housing projects. They, they build those. They don't belong in a rural county. If we're going to build workforce county and uh, workforce housing in the rural parts of the county, it needs to be home by home, scattered site development. We build larger projects within the cities, but in order to accomplish that, we've got to be willing to transfer county unincorporated rogos to the cities. Makes a lot of sense. Until you realize that when we transfer them, we don't have them to prevent takings cases in 2023. See what I mean? There's not a good answer to that question. <laughs> there is not a good answer. Quick, quick follow-up. Would you agree that we're running out of space in our cities and that they have to be in county areas? No. We better be running out of space in our cities because if it's an empty lot in 2023, they're going to have a takings cases and they're probably going to lose millions of dollars in that takings cases. So far, we just won one. That's good. That's a good thing. We'll win some. We lost one in 2004 called the Shattuck case. We wrote a six million dollar check, I believe, that, for that one. Thank you, David. Non-lightning question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask my favorite question. Term limits, yes or no? What? Yes. What's the question? It's a toss-up. You can meet What's the question? <laughs> yes, I suppose, but it's, it's a wash. Either way, you either get what we have in Tallahassee with people who have to be yes, educated no. or not. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Vicki, uh, 
If you're elected, what would be your primary goal, the initial thing that you're going to attack if you were elected? I think I would like to tackle county code enforcement for vacation rentals. Toughing it or slackening it all? Toughening it. I, I think they're doing a good job. I think they're on the right track with where they're going so far in the collections that they're making. However, I think that we need more people out there that uh, we can put out there at night even. Uh, I know that they try to to split it up so that some of them are on call at night or at least they're out there and looking and, and seeing what's going on and how many cars are really in that driveway and so forth. But I think we need to increase that, definitely. All right, yes or no, single member districts for the county? No. No. Thank you, guys. Very short period of time. Yeah. 
question will be for Stephen. Uh, you've not served in any elected offices and you do not have any experience in state or local government. So what is your strategy if elected to navigate the political maze of Tallahassee and to bring home valuable state resources to your place? Well, that's true, but I have been elected to the Commodore of the Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association, so let's not just talk about that. Um, what I would do is, uh, uh, I would stand up to special interests. For instance, my campaign takes no corporate money, uh, no big sugar money. Uh, it all comes from people like you in the audience. You probably recognize half the people on the list there. So I won't be beholden to anybody. I won't be afraid to stand on a chair and bang pots and pans and call out corruption. And, uh, and when people are trying to mislead with uh, maybe a Sophie's Choice, I'll call that out as well. So, Steve, uh, as a Democrat, how do you feel you could make an impact in Tallahassee in a Republican-controlled legislature, an impact that your opponent could not? Well, it's interesting that we're talking about red and blue here when everybody knows that the water quality is going down and degrading uh, as we speak. And so when you talk to people about clean water, for instance, everybody wants clean water. It doesn't become a partisan issue. So the fact that I work with a lot of Republicans on a boat every day, and we're able to have a friendly discourse, we're also you know, able to agree and disagree. Um, I think that I can bring that experience and, and reach across the aisle come to some common ground. Representative Rashine, how would you evaluate the state's response um, to Hurricane Irma here in the Keys? Can I get that done in 90 seconds? Uh, well, I think uh, locally and statewide, we certainly learned a number of lessons from the response and preparedness of Hurricane Irma. I had the opportunity to sit on the select committee on hurricane response and, uh, and preparedness. And um, I think that we could have done a better job as a state. I think we could have done a better job as a community, um, whether it is in terms of making sure we have the proper fuel, um, the proper amount of law enforcement on the road, uh, evacuation times. Yes, there was much room uh, for improvement, but I think we have learned many lessons. And um, knock on wood, we won't have to put those to use, but um, I think uh, we'll be in a much, much better position should a big one come our way. Steve, since I've been beating up on the representative a little, I, I, I want to say that she arguably has a decent record for environmental legislation in a very antagonistic uh, setting in, in the Florida legislature. So are you unhappy with what the uh, representative has done for, for the environment? Um, it's interesting because my research actually shows that my opponent has a D rating from the Environmental Caucus. So I don't think that's really an acceptable grade in school. So no, I'm not satisfied. I, I, I'm going to say in what is a fairly antagonistic legislative um, situation, she is one of the very few Republicans who uh, made legislative efforts at all for Florida. So that, uh, uh, frame my question in <laughs> she has a D rating. <laughs> well, and just to remind everybody of the rules, when if one candidate mentions the other or calls the other out, we let that candidate respond. So how are you? You get to respond. Yeah, again, I'm confused at which caucus that he's speaking of, but um, I brought over $75 million home to this community for water and environmental projects. I um, was a co-sponsor of the Legacy Florida Bill, which um, mandates that the state spend a minimum of $200 million on Everglades restoration. Um, I passed the Florida Key Stewardship Act, which covers two very important issues, land acquisition and water quality, right here in the Florida Keys. And I also was the um, House uh, floor presenter for Senate Bill 10, which I know is a priority of um, Mr. Friedman's, and that would set up the southern reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee. Can I respond to that? Well, she didn't really 
yes, but it's important. So the Florida Legacy Act designated $200 million for the Everglades from Amendment 1, where 75% of us voted to get Everglades restoration, land acquisition, stuff like that. So you're talking about designation of money that was already designated for the purpose to which it was supposed to go. So then when she presents a bill, 12 hours before that bill was presented, I was in her office asking her why she hadn't publicly supported it. And it was the next day that she presented it. Yes, she got a microphone, she got to read it. Did she co-sponsor it? Did she publicly support it? Not until that day. For Representative Rashheim, if elected, this will be your last term due to, to, to term limits, as you said. Are there any initiatives that you've not been able to accomplish yet in your time in office that you would like to finalize in your last two years? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. I think that our state could do a better job in terms of resiliency. Um, working on policies uh, having to do with climate change, we're seeing the effects of uh, the new kid in uh, town, ocean acidification, which is disproportionately affecting our coral reefs. Uh, also, our, our fisheries, our lobster fisheries, I'd like to see some more done on that. We also have a new, uh, it's not new, it's actually been around for years, um, a coral disease that is affecting the entire reef tract from the Keys all the way up to Martin County. I'd like to see some more work on that. And again, our, our community and our state is still very, very, very much in recovery mode. Um, we need to make sure that we have the resources and the communications lines communication lines are open between the agencies and our community to make sure that the funding is there, but if the funding is not going towards the folks that need it, it's not working. So those are some um, some of the bigger issues and then I'm looking forward to um, working on the anti-discrimination uh, proposals that I've worked on in the past with eliminating LGBTQ uh, discrimination in terms of housing, employment, and public accommodations. Question for Polly. The uh, Good Old Boy Network in Tallahassee, have you ever had to stand up to them and say, I'm not going to vote for your proposal? And what were the consequences? Yes, so that's, um, that's a, a, a tough issue, Bill, and I appreciate that. I was one of four Republicans to vote to expand Medicaid because I represent one of the biggest areas of uh, the highest uninsured or underinsured population in Florida. Um, vacation rentals have come up many times tonight. I was the deciding vote and killing a very, very bad bill that would have put our uh, ordinances and our policies into, back into the Stone Age. Um, it's, it's, uh, retribution is a real thing in the political process, and unfortunately that's a reality. Um, and I've had to take tough votes where you know, I didn't necessarily agree with them, but I had tens of millions of dollars online for my community. And it's, um, you know, it comes down to making a, a good and a bad list. Is this going to be good for my district? Is this going to be bad for my district? And I think that that's how I align my votes. And the vote for Stephen. Um, Stephen, as you, I'm sure, know, uh, we've been seeing some pretty serious mental health impacts from uh, Irma in a lot of different ways. And the local health department is part of the state agency. Do you think we need more resources to provide services for people dealing with the trauma from the hurricane and afterwards, and how specifically would you look to get those for us? Uh, yes, I believe we need uh, more services. Uh, expanding health care, uh, uh, Medicaid would be a great idea as well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, I came down, I prioritized health care for myself and my family. Um, and as time went by, I found out that uh, the Affordable Care Act actually worked for me. It cut my costs in half. My kids are on uh, healthy kids care. So um, I, I don't think that health care should be about luck. I think that we need to um, uh, create more legislation that brings more funding to us and when we have opportunities like we did with Medicaid, not to leave it on the table somewhere else. Matthew, you know, you know what time it is. I do. <laughs> I do indeed. Uh, Stephen, I've got a question for you. Florida has a solidly Republican legislature. It's possible we'll have another Republican government. And in, it's possible. And, and, and let's get into worse. A new Republican Senate? What can you do in a Republican dominated state to advance your program? Everything I possibly can. Look, I'm a fishing guy. 
I don't know how the sausage is made, all right? But I know that I'm bound to determine to reach across the aisle and work with as many people as I can. So if it's Republican dominated, democratically dominated, I will work for the constituency to do the right thing. I will listen to the constituents and uh, I will favor what they feel like needs to be done and I will do my best to talk with whoever is there, be it Mickey Mouse. <laughs> This is a big subject, but as quickly as you can, um, I'd like to ask Stephen, you mentioned that you would like to advocate for smarter policies on Everglades restoration. What do you mean by that? What are the smaller policies you think are not being implemented? Smarter policies? Smart policies. I don't recall saying smarter policies. I would just like to actually see some of these um, these programs accelerate. We came up with the Central Everglades Restoration Plan in 2000. It's old enough to vote now. We've got 65, 68 projects that are slated to be done, and at this rate, they won't be done for 100 years. So that's a step in the right direction to get a uh, reservoir built south of Lake Okeechobee. We need to convey fresh water to the Florida Bay so that I don't have to suffer going through 40,000 acres of seagrass trying to get to some fish that I hope are still there. So smarter, yes, but we also need to all get on board and accelerate these programs that are already in place. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're already there. We just need the political will to do it. Bill, we're doing pretty good on time for you guys, two panelists, so you can. One more? Well, you can <laughs> ask any question you want. Uh, well, you state, state law regulates how we can ex uh, spend the tourist tax money, the TDC money. Would you be in favor of expanding that uh, to other uses here in Monroe County? Good question, yes or no? Would I be in favor of expanding that? I would be in favor of letting that um, be done by the local community that, that governs it. I would let that be their choice if that was going to be more money or not. I'll let me say, excuse me, as long as it remains uh, tourism related, I think you have to find a balance when you're dealing with, uh, you know, you're being a steward of the tax, taxpayer dollars and those dollars are, were meant um, that industry imposed the rules on themselves. So again, when you're dealing with taxpayer dollars, you definitely want to find a balance. But in the age of aging infrastructure, um, you know, our tourism uh, numbers are very, very high, even post Irma. And if there's a there's a need to switch things around, I think we should take that and anything's on the table. Yeah, last question. Um, I guess for uh, Representative Rushine, we've heard a lot about build out in 2023, um, and that is the result of the evacuation requirements in the area of critical concern. What responsibility does the state have to help the county out with its liabilities, and uh, how are you going to? bring that along as the single representative from this area? I think the state has an incredibly important um, responsibility in this issue. We are an area of critical state concern. We were designated by the state of Florida, and with that designation comes some pretty extreme challenges. And I think that they have shown that they want to be our partner. Anytime that we take a delegation to Tallahassee, whether they're from Key West or Ocean Reef, they talk about this issue, build out, workforce housing, density, traffic. Um, they are hearing our message, and I think you saw the, um, you know, the 1,300 units. That was just something that they wanted to offer us. I want to reiterate that those are optional. Each different community up and down the Keys has its own unique needs, and I think Tallahassee definitely recognizes that, and they know that they are going to have to stand there and be our partner because they, um, well, I certainly wouldn't stand for bank bankrupting Monroe County over overtaking cases and things like that. So we're going to need to continue in the next for years coming up with those creative solutions that I think um, everybody is starting to talk about right now. Thank you guys. See you. I'll let you <laughs>
All right, this is for U.S. Congress. Uh, Carlos, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Todd, and uh, thank you all for being here. You know, I always tell my, my colleagues and people I meet throughout the country, when people think of the Florida Keys, they think of tourism, boating, fishing, bars, restaurants, all those things. But I tell them that there's actually a, a vibrant community here locals that really care, that really make a difference. And I see a lot of the people in this room. I remember a year ago, a lot of us were working together trying to help uh, this community recover. And I'm just so proud to represent this community and, and proud to, to be here tonight to get to share some ideas with you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Always happy to be with my family here in Key West. Thank you, Todd, for having us. And thank you to Guys, the panel. Guys, the sign is down. <laughs> My name is Debbie Mukarsel Powell, and I'm running for Congress in Florida's 26th District. And I'm running because the opportunities that brought my family here are disappearing so quickly, especially for families living in this district. My mother brought my sisters and I when I was 14 from Ecuador. I started working at the age of 15. I was very fortunate to get a scholarship, attend college, get a master's degree, and I've dedicated the past 20 years to working in this community to improve the lives of the families. Thank so you. I'm very proud to be here tonight. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Again, no, don't hold signs. Be, be polite for the people behind you. And now they are your phone ring. <laughs> Matthew. Wow. Uh, uh, welcome to you both. Uh, I have a question for the two of you. Florida has had two of the deadliest, most heinous mass shootings in American history in the last two years. In response, the state has passed, with, with, with acknowledgement to, um, to uh, Representative Rexheim, the state has passed some restrictions on firearms. As a representative of our state, are you positioned to take a leadership, you are positioned to take a leadership role on national gun safety? Will you do that? This is, um, as many of you know, it's a very personal issue for me, and I've been a public advocate for gun safety and gun reform laws now for several years, not just now that I'm campaigning. Um, I lost my father to gun violence. And I can tell you that it's not that complicated. Um, we need the political courage, not when it's convenient, but when it's needed in this community. And I am 100% committed to doing whatever I can once I'm elected, to pass universal background checks, my opponent voted against that back in 2015, and to pass legislation and introduce legislation so that we can ban automatic military style weapons. Thank you. So the, the answer is yes, because I'm already leading on an issue. And you mentioned the gun reform agenda that we saw passed out of Florida, and I think that's a wonderful model for the U.S. Congress to adopt common sense uh, answers, responses to some of these challenges. We have to be honest, right? We know that no law is going to guarantee that we never see a tragedy again, but we know that some laws and some regulations can make us safer. So immediately after the Las Vegas mass shooting, I introduced legislation to ban bombs. Immediately. Uh, after the Pulse nightclub shooting, and by the way, uh, some of the, uh, the parents of one of the victims are, are, are very close friends and supporters of mine, and I've worked with them on a lot of these issues. I introduced a bill to make sure that people like the individual who committed that atrocity can't get their hands on weapons. And on all these issues, let me tell you, we all have our parties here, some blue hats, some red hats, that's all fine. But if we care about these issues, we need people in both parties who are willing to reach across the aisle to get it done. Because unless one party ever has 60 votes in the Senate, a majority in the House, and a president of that party, things aren't going to happen. And by the way, when the Democratic Party had those numbers in Congress and the president, they did nothing on gun control. So I think we need more people to work together to get something That's done. And, true, I definitely, and I definitely think that Florida is a wonderful model. That's not true. He didn't call you out. So, Democrats. That doesn't do well. We're not going there. We're not going there. Jen. For uh, Congressman Corbello. Um, 
Access to reasonable or affordable health care is obviously a major problem in this country. We talk a lot about um, medical insurance, but really that's driven by the cost of medical care. So what can the federal government be doing to help to control the cost of prescription drugs and other medical care so that we can afford um, and have access to medical care? Thank you, Jennifer. What we need to do is put patients and consumers in control. Uh, most of our health care laws in this country, from the ACA and others uh, before it, that have written, been written by both parties, are designed to protect all the incumbents in the health care systems. The big hospital chains that are making record margins, the health insurance companies that are making record profits, and uh, big pharma that's also doing well these days. One of the big flaws with the ACA, which is why I think that it should be replaced with something better, is that it was written by lobbyists from a lot of these organizations. And it was written to protect the profits of these organizations. So I think we need to keep the good in the ACA, and I give my Democratic colleagues credit all the time for things like covering people with pre-existing conditions, making sure we have a community rating, no gender discrimination in healthcare whatsoever, allowing young people to stay on their parents' plans. Those are all good, and we should keep those, but we should also introduce some market forces into the healthcare system so that it's consumers, patients that can drive down costs. There's a perfect example. Right now, there's something called the pharmacist gag order. If you go to the pharmacy and you go to buy a drug, a prescription drug, that pharmacist cannot tell you, hey, if you pay cash, you're going to end up paying less because it's going to be less than your copay. Uh, because of the way the laws are written, and that's absurd. Some hospitals have anti steerage clauses. That's wrong, too. Bill, I'll let, I'll let Debbie uh, follow up on that on health care. How do you feel? Look, um, let's be honest here. We have a Republican Party and we have a congressman that voted to take away health care for over 100,000 people living in this community when he took that decisive vote, Congressman Corbello took the decisive vote back in May 2017, which is one of the reasons why I decided to run, to repeal the Affordable Care Act. We know that there are things that we need to fix in the ACA. We understand that. But to vote to take that away from millions of Americans in this country was a cruel vote without any option. And I can tell you that Congressman Corbello just voted also to take away the protections from people living in with pre-existing conditions. And right now we have 20 states that are suing, they're all Republican governors that are suing the federal government to take away those protections. We need change. We need Democrats in the House. And we need them. Carlos, you absolutely get to respond. Yeah, you're just an old upset. Thank you, Todd. And look, uh, this, first of all, my opponent oftentimes says that this is why she's running for office. And the real reason she's running for this office is because she ran for state senate last time and the voters of this community rejected her. So that's why she's running for this notion that people want to take health care away from others is just absurd. Look, I have a family, I have children, my wife and I were talking about the health care challenge that we have uh, close to our family. No one wants to take health care away from anyone. We just want the health care system to work better, to work for patients, not for everyone who's making a lot of money off of the health care system. And in order to do that, we do have to replace not just the ACA, but a lot of what we have today something better and what we attempted to do knowing that it may be difficult is taking the ma'am ma'am in the green shirt if you speak out again we're gonna ask you to leave do you understand thank you Todd okay what we tried to do is take that first step and when people say oh well this would have that bill would have done X Y and Z well that doesn't take into account that there was more uh, that we wanted to do in addition to that, and that we are doing today, by the way, working with uh, across the aisle to improve our country's health care system. So that's the truth about health care. This campaign line, this talking point about wanting to take away people's health care, I don't think anyone in this room, Republican or Democrat, wants to take away health care for anyone. We just want the system to work better for everyone. Thank you.
Carlos, how do I get on your plane? Hey. <laughs> before, Nan, before you do it, guys, we are lucky to have the congressional race here in Key West. Yes. And if we're going to treat them disrespectfully, they may not come back. So, okay. <laughs> my friends and supporters in the room for staying quiet. This should be a dialogue, not a pep rally. That's what I'm talking about. Oh. Man, give me something really controversial. <laughs> Congressman, um, I think it's fair to say that you're something of an outlier in your party on climate change and immigration policy. And you've worked really hard to pass an immigration bill and friends in the Freedom Caucus made that pretty much impossible. Um, why should we return a Republican majority that can't get anywhere on those topics? Well, I'm running in this district, and I'm running based on my record, not based on anyone else's record. And I'm not asking people in other districts or telling them what they need to do. But again, I go back to what I said earlier. We have some major challenges in this country, from immigration to guns to health care to climate change. Unless we have people in both parties working together, nothing is going to get solved. This is not the system we asked for. This is the system that Jefferson and Madison designed for us, and we have to deal with it. And this system requires consensus building. Now, you can send flamethrowers to Washington, people who are 100% committed with their leadership, I'll give you a perfect example. There's an opening in both parties when it comes to who's, who's going to lead uh, in the next Congress. I have not made a commitment to any Republican leader because I have a set of demands and reforms that I want to see in the House to make it more conducive to bipartisan work. My opponent is blindly in Nancy Pelosi's corner. And we cannot double down on the politics of the past if we are going to solve the challenges of the present. So on all these issues, Nancy, we need Republicans and Democrats who are willing to reach across the aisle. I have done that every single day since I've been in Congress. I will do it every single day, no matter who's the leader, who's the speaker, and uh, how much please they give me for it. And Debbie, you get to so, Yes, um, to he's saying that he's not going to vote blindly for any uh, party leadership, yet he has voted blindly for Paul Ryan as Speaker of the House, who is the most extreme when it comes to immigration reform, who did not allow to bring in a, a bill to the floor to discuss, and who also, Paul Ryan's proudest moment and uh, Congressman Corbello's proudest moment, has been to pass a tax reform bill that gives cuts to the most wealthiest Americans and leaving middle class families behind. So. Just look at the record. Don't say things that are not true. You have been supporting Paul Ryan time and time again. You campaigned with Speaker Ryan. You have accepted money from Speaker Ryan. So please, before you start accusing others of things, you need to take responsibility for the actions that you've taken in the past four years being a congressman. Respond to us, but keep it focused on the Paul Ryan issue. That's what <laughs> yeah, like I said, and, and she can't escape this. I mean, she'll try. There is an opening in both parties for leadership in the next Congress. And I have decided to use my leverage to try to make the institution better. And I have a lot of middle-of-the-road Democrats who are friends of mine. They're not supporting Nancy Pelosi for speaker because they know it's not going to work. They know that Congress isn't going to do the things that it needs to do. And again, I don't think we should elect people who are doubling down on the failed policies and approaches of the past. I think we need to look towards the future and figure out how we can restore some civility, decency, and cooperation in our politics. And the only way we're going to do it, by the way, speaking of immigration, because it's, it's well, the issue that... that looks like there'll be another... All right, I'll bring it up later. How about Paul Ryan and you? That was the question. Hey, Sloan. Well, yeah, call him on it. You call no, him on it. No, so we'll get to it. I, I don't want to kick you out. That's all right. <laughs> I've been kicked out oh. a lot of places. Then, <laughs> Trump lost the 26th district by 16 percentage points to Secretary Clinton. We hear a lot about a blue wave in November, especially in women's blue 
you're in a tight race with the congressman. Are you feeling good about your race? I feel very good about the race, especially because I have all of you behind me and I feel that energy every single day. Look, this is going to be a tight race, okay? Um, it's not an easy race, but we are working extremely hard. I have thousands of volunteers knocking on doors every single day. And we hear families across the district very loud and, and very loud and clear. They rejected Trump in 2016, and they're rejecting those hateful policies coming out of Washington, D.C., and we need a Democratic majority so that we can hold this administration accountable and have some check and balances to this administration. So um, I really want to thank, since you're asking me, everyone that's working so hard, knocking on doors and volunteering. I know that we can win. We still have 50 days ahead of us. There's a lot of work to do, but I'm very grateful to have Key West, my family, with me. Okay. So I'll bring up immigration since everybody wants to talk about it. Um, I get no one's going to ask me how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually would like both candidates to tell us what is your position on immigration and what changes. First of all, do you believe that illegal immigration is a problem? And if so, what are your solutions to solve it? Carl, let's go first. And remember, guys, if you call up the other candidate, you, it goes back and forth. So it's up to you. So yes, illegal immigration is a problem, and the main problem with it is that it's illegal. We need to promote legal immigration to our country. We need to have an orderly immigration system. Now, going back to standing up to party leadership, I led, and every single Democrat in the House supported me, and, and many Republicans did as well, an effort that challenged the House Republican leadership and actually compelled them to bring an immigration solution to the floor of the House. And I'll tell you more or less what was in that bill, because I think this is what a compromise on immigration probably looks like. We had border security, $25 billion for border security. That was less than the Senate immigration compromise of 2013, which most Democrats supported. We have a path to citizenship for 2 million dreamers, young immigrants brought to our country as children, the people who I really believe are the victims of a broken immigration system. We have reforms for asylum laws because there's a lot of abuse and we know that uh, here in South Florida with regards to our asylum laws today. And in that legislation, we would have also ended forever the policy of family separation, barring any administration, this one and future ones, from ever adopting that kind of a deterrent tactic again. This legislation tried to marry two very popular things in Congress. Well, some Republicans, a lot of Democrats, uh, have been advocating for dreamers for many years. And many Republicans, some Democrats, have been calling for cyber security for so many years. This bill got 121 votes on the House floor, all Republicans, zero Democrats. Exactly, zero Democrats. There's a reason for that. Um, as an immigrant, I pay very close attention to what Congressman Corbello says he wants to do and then does. This is typical of Congressman Corbello. He says one thing here when he's in front of all of you and then does something completely different. We had an opportunity to pass the Clean Dream Act and protect the dreamers back in uh, 2017. We had over 200 co-sponsors. Congresswoman Elena Ross Layton was one of those co-sponsors. Congressman Corbello did not sign on to that bill. Then he said he would not vote for any budget that did, did not include a resolution for DREAMers, but then he voted for the budget. Then he said he was going to bring a discharge petition so that we can finally bring a comprehensive immigration reform bill to the House, to the floor. Um, what did he do? Once again, he caved in to the most extreme Republicans who are anti-immigration in his party. Now, what I think we need to do right away, and I know it's a priority if we win the majority in the House in November, is pass the Clean Dream Act, protect those that have TPS status right now, and also provide a comprehensive immigration system that will provide legal status for those millions of immigrants that have been here for over a decade, that are contributing to our economy, that are, you know, that don't have any criminal records, there has to be a path, and I know that we can do that if we win in November. A couple things that she, she mentioned about me, and, and it's evident that she doesn't understand the concept of compromise, which is the big problem we have in Washington, D.C. today. The Senate cannot pass a Clean Dream Act. Not this Senate, 
not the next Senate. The White House will not get behind the Clean Dream Act. So what did we try to do? We tried to build a compromise that could satisfy more parties to get uh, a solution. If we want to get an immigration reform bill done, that's the only way we're going to do it. By the way, the time that I voted on a spending bill that she criticizes me for, that included billions of dollars in recovery dollars for the Florida Keys. And I want it to be clear to all the reporters here and all the men and women in this room that she apparently would have voted against that legislation. And for me, that would have been unforgivable. Number one, we had made progress on immigration because the Senate had agreed to have a debate. Number two, I was not going to vote against the Florida Keys getting those recovery dollars. Only one response. Is that one? Exactly. All I'm saying is when you say something and you do something else in Washington, D.C., people are paying attention. You said you would not vote for that spending bill, and then you did. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Congressman Carvello, have you seen enough evidence to support impeachment of the president? <laughs> Based on the evidence that I have seen today, there is an insufficient, insufficient evidence. However, there is an ongoing probe by Mr. Mueller, and I fully support that probe. Uh, when Mr. Mueller uh, completes uh, his investigation, he will have a report. And that will be the appropriate time for every member of Congress and uh, every senator uh, to reach a decision. It's something we should take seriously. Impeachment is one of the most powerful tools that the Founding Fathers gave us on the Constitution. I'll get to this Constitution Day. Happy Constitution Day to everyone here. And uh, we should use it very carefully. It's a tool that we have seen been misused in the past by a Republican Congress, divided the nation, created unnecessary drama in our country. Uh, we need sober people in Washington, D.C. who are going to take this seriously, who are going to look at all the facts, and who are going to demand that all the investigations uh, be allowed to proceed until they reach their conclusions. That's a good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman, speaking of President Trump, <laughs> Do you agree with his position that the Puerto Rican death toll from Hurricane Maria was much smaller than the general one over 3,000? And if you do not, what do you think the consequences are of having the head of the executive branch and the leader of our country depart so far from widely accepted fact? No, I immediately criticized that statement, and I was glad to see other Republicans did so as well. Like the president has a problem. He has really thin skin. He thinks everything's personal against him. So if someone says, oh, 3,000 people died, he thinks that that's, they're saying somehow it was his fault personally or the federal government uh, didn't do its, its job. And the truth is there are many reasons why uh, Maria specifically was so difficult for Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is a small island. It had a very weak infrastructure before the storm. It was obviously financially strained. And when a Category 5 storm hits a small island, it's going to be difficult. So what the president should do is accept the empirical evidence of everything that has happened in Puerto Rico, understand that any time there's a natural disaster, there are lessons to be learned. We can always do better. We know that here. There was a good discussion about that. Uh, just a few minutes ago here. Uh, so again, uh, and this is my approach to uh, this office. People ask me all the time, how do you deal with Trump? It's very easy. The same way I would deal with any president. When he's wrong, or when she's wrong, you call them out, you say it, you hold them accountable. If they're doing something that's good, that's right, that helps the country or helps our community, you get behind that. And that's the type of sobriety I really think we need in our politics today. How do we hold them accountable? How are you holding them accountable? Well, I'll give you an example uh, on environmental policy. He had a, a head of the EPA who was a complete disaster. And for months, uh, a lot of Republicans and Democrats increased pressure on the White House, and we finally forced out Scott Pruitt, a guy who should have never been in that position. Not only is he reckless in his policies, but he's totally unethical. And in response to the administration's uh, in my view, misguided, wrong-headed, 
environmental policies, what has Congress done? We are investing record amounts in environmental protection, in research, in making sure, yeah, look, look, look at the budget. There was a bipartisan budget agreement and all the money's there. So you know, we can move all, all we want, but it's true. Uh, look it up. And that's how you hold the executive accountable. Congress has the power to purse. It's a co-equal branch of government, and I take that very seriously. I want to ask everybody, how are we doing time-wise? Time. Ready? time. Okay. We have a marriage race after this. We have a marriage race. We're going to do one more round. I'm not even going to pretend that it's a lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> All right, love it. You guys, you want to get back to the ladies? So I'm not going to be good. Be good. People usually don't tell me to talk loud. The Congressional Leadership Fund, and I want to be very clear, this is not a PAC linked to the congressman. Is airing attack ads linking you and your husband to a Ukrainian oligarch? Can you comment? The Ecuadorian immigrant will comment. Um, look, I think that this is exactly what voters hate about politics, and it is extremely shameful that Republicans are launching personal attacks against my family, which are false, and they're doing it because they have nothing to run on. Their record is terrible, and they can't run on their record. They can't, they're trying to distract all of us from the reality, which is that they are sabotaging our healthcare system. They are passing tax cuts to benefit their contributors and special interests. They are horrible as it pertains to the environment. I mean, I don't have to tell everyone here these horrific images that we're seeing from our waterways or the toxic algae blooms. This is all connected. And so, thank you for bringing that up because it's an opportunity for me to tell all of you that they're false, it's not true, and they're doing this across the country, it's a tactic. And they're using lies to attack all of us because they don't want to let go of these seats. Jeff. For Debbie, if elected, how much time will you commit to spending in the Florida Keys and listening to the concerns of its residents? For example, would you uh, be open to uh, holding regular town hall meetings? I am absolutely open to holding regular town meetings. I would love to come as often as I can. I love coming down here. I think I've shown all of you for years not just when I've been running, but even in between. Um, I think that it's ex extremely important, you know, the job of a representative is to represent you. And I need to be hearing what is going on on the ground, especially when you're in DC, when you're going back and forth. I need to know what the issues that we're facing currently are and the priorities and how I personally can help and work with local elected officials to be effective. Short answer question. <laughs> You've both been attending these candidate forums for months now. And I want to ask each of you, what question has your opponent struggled with and possibly been less than forthcoming with? I think healthcare. I think that uh, Congressman Corbello doesn't truly understand the problems that we're facing in our healthcare system. Uh, I've had a lot of experience working with doctors, nurses, dealing with the shortage of healthcare providers in this community. Um, and there's a lot that we can actually do right away to reduce costs and manage that. And I don't think Congressman Corbello understands the healthcare system very well. Well, I'll answer the question honestly. This is our first forum, so, so I can't tell you what she's struggling with because this is the first time we actually sit together to have this kind of conversation, so I, I don't know where she got that from. But anyway, I will say this, uh, because Jennifer brought it up. Um, the Keys represents about 15% of the district. Uh, I'll tell you that in our Washington, D.C. office, and Nicole's here, she could confirm it, we probably spend about 50% of our time working on issues that have to do with the Florida Keys, just because there's so many needs here and they're so connected to the federal government, whether it's affordable housing, the environment, transportation, military, you have it all here in the Florida Keys. And I'll tell you now, this is the second opponent that I run against that has pretended to live in the Florida Keys. My opponent in the last election changed her registration briefly to I guess a second home they have in the Florida Keys and took a picture 
with it and put it on Facebook uh, just so that the people of Florida Keys might believe that she lived here. She then changed her registration back to, to, to her home where she lives. I've never done anything like that. I've never pretended to be from here or to live here, but every single day I have worked in Washington, D.C. for the Florida Keys and never more than after Hurricane Irma. And that's the commitment uh, that I leave you with here tonight, that I will be honest, sincere, you'll always know how I feel, whether it's in agreement with my party or against it, and I'll always put the priorities of this community and this city, Key West, first. So you can respond on the, the only thing that I can say is that it's very typical of uh, Congressman Corbello to go into the personal attacks because he cannot run on his record. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. This one's for both of you question. as quickly as possible. Um, do you agree with the current administration's position on our relationship with Cuba? And if not, um, what, how would you like to see it differ? <laughs> Look, I have um, a lot of very close friends that had to leave Cuba under the Castro regime, and it's very personal to them, and they, they're still uh, living with, with the things that they lost when they left Cuba. Now, I completely support engagement with the Cuban people while being extremely firm with the Cuban government, but I think families should be allowed to visit their family members in Cuba. I think we need to engage in educational and cultural exchanges. I think the only way to empower our neighbors is to giving them the information and the resources that they need to stand up to their government. The uh, current policy is really pretty much uh, what President Obama left behind. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a lot of agreement there. We need to hold the government accountable. You saw this administration try to do that. They blacklisted certain government-owned companies that are owned by the Cuban military and Cuban state security. But in terms of family travel, uh, people visiting Cuba, it's, it's generally the same. I think that there can be some benefit to that as long as we're clear-eyed about the relationship. These the people in power there are still the same people who had a nuclear missiles uh, installed on the island and pointed them right here where we are at today. So we need to be clear right about that and uh, understand that they're also part of the axis that has destroyed Venezuela. It's causing so much uh, death and destruction in Nicaragua now as well. So when we engage uh, with the Cubans, we need to know exactly who it is we're dealing with. Thank you both. Let's give them a
end for the year. It's a big race, a key West mayoral race. The only thing we can guarantee is that a female will be our next target. <laughs> Focus on you and doing the right things for the right reasons, regardless of the high level Shush! I'd like to make sure that as a city, we are facts based, which means I want to focus on financial responsibility, accountability, community focus, transparency, and sensible solutions based on data, not just emotions or wishes. I ask for your vote and your direction. Thank you. Hey, Terry. Oh, thank you. I'm Terry Johnston. I was born in a small town in Iowa of about 900 people. I went to college on the first athlete of scholarships that were given to women in the United States. Um, I graduated and then I spent the next 24 years in corporate and international marketing and sales. Uh, but most recently, for the last 22 years, I've been a small business owner. I am prepared, I'm qualified, and I am ready to be your next mayor of the U.S. Yeah! Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you heard him. Uh, I'd like to put a question to both of you, and, and uh, forgive me for reading it, but I, I want to be, um, I want to put it uh, rightly. That means it's going to be really <laughs> <laughs> what skills, qualifications, and temperament do you bring to the office of mayor your opponent specifically does not? Please give examples to support your answer. I'll start. Well, first of all, what I bring to the dais is um, a sense of team building and consensus building. And I think that that's so important. I've got eight years of experience uh, serving the city of Key West, and I had a very successful eight years of bringing forth resolutions, of being able to give and take with the other six commissioners to accomplish things in Key West. And I think that that's one of the skills I'm gonna bring. The other skill I'm gonna bring is a sense of humor, because in public politics right now, you've got to have a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, the, the, the third, um, skill that I'm going to bring is, uh, is really a, a sense of community. Um, I'm out there in the community. I'm working with children in the community. Uh, I'm working with businesses in the community. I'm a small business owner. I understand the, the stresses and strains of a small business owner in Key West right now. And I'm going to work with the residents because I also understand this, the strains of being a tourism-driven market and the impacts that they can have on uh, the residents of the community. Yes, what I bring to the table will be not only my hometown experience from a small business family, but also my corporate experience. And that was where I was extremely successful in bringing teams together who were not on the same page at all and helping to define where they had things in common and what issues they had to focus on. I was very successful with that. At the current time, I am very up to date on just what financial issues and concerns we have and how much money we have in our budget and what we can do with those things. I want to make sure that we stay community focused. I have an extremely good relationship with our employees in the city across all departments. I have established relationships throughout the county especially with our emergency management teams, as well as relationships across the state, our lobbyists, as well as our folks up in Washington. And I would like to intensify those relationships for the betterment of our community. For Terry, uh, an improved and potentially pedestrian of Wall Street is a large uh, part of your campaign platform. That's one of those issues that we talk a lot about, that nothing ever seems to happen when you studies and nothing ever happens. So what what would you, what, first of all, what is your vision for Wall Street and what would you do differently if you're mayor to try to make it actually happen? Well, I, I think it's gonna happen just by the fact that we have a new commission that's coming up, a very exciting commission that's willing to try new ideas and new techniques 
and not always handle situations the same way that we have for the last 30 years. My idea really is to start a pilot program. And we'll start a pilot program in about three blocks. Um, and, and make it very enjoyable. You know, bring tables out, bring art out, uh, have some music, and let people enjoy the beauties of Duval Street. What we're gonna do with three months in, in a pilot program is we'll be able to tell whether it has any impact on the commercial properties around and whether our re residents enjoy it. Um, we're a local community and, and we, we hear the results of all the things that we try and I think we'll be able to figure that out very quickly. But what I'm most excited about is a brand new commission that's willing to try new ideas and new techniques that we haven't for about the last 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question, we'll start with Margaret, but for both of you. Cotts Homeless Shelter, 15 years at the Sheriff's Headquarters. The Sheriff says it needs to go. The county Commission has said they can't support it there. City Commission has just been kicking it down the road for the last 15 years. Where should it go? What should it be? Should it be a full service facility 24 7? Should it be basically a cot, a cot and a hot? You know? what, what should it be? Start with Mark. You're absolutely right. That issue has been kicked down the can, or the can has been kicked down the path, I guess I should say, for many, many years. And I am one of the few people on that commission who in the last couple of years has said, what are we going to do? We cannot have another situation where you face lawsuits similar to what has happened with the prior duck tours where we just didn't handle it right. What should it be? It should be something that is an overnight temporary shelter, not where people stay for years at a time. I've heard that some people there are working, let's charge them a fee for the time period that they're there. I think that the public is very good with us. Would I like to see it stay in the sheriff's thing? Well, yeah, but we've been told it's not going to work. Just like the city made mosquito control relief, which put a burden on the county, we have to move out of the sheriff's spot. Quite honestly, I'd like to see something done close to the Easter Seals property. Or we do have an acre of land near the steam plant, but a lot of people don't want to see it go there. But it, that is one of the spots where it meets the major criteria that were defined by a city planning director years ago. So we need to look at all the facts, make some decisions, and move forward. But yeah, basic, basic uh, necessities, social services provided by others. Uh, thank you, Bill. This issue is near and dear to me, and basically we have not kicked the train down the road. Um, when I was a city commissioner in 2014, we, uh, we had a hard-fought um, debate on the location of COTS, uh, as, you, as you might be able to imagine. And we won on a 4-3 vote where we placed it at Easter Seals. In fact, we had drawings for Easter Seals. We worked up um, a, uh, a temporary shelter for Easter Seals that meant the wind codes and was above base flood elevation. So we didn't take it down the road. After Irma, the current city commission made a decision to now take that pro uh, pro property that we had COTS planned on going and making oh, it affordable housing. Now, two very important issues, obviously, and you know you can't say one's more important than the other one, but we did have a location. Um, the sheriff wants to build affordable housing on his property. We have 104 units of affordable housing going up on College Road. I'm not sure why we can't make a swap and put the affordable housing that the uh, sheriff wants into our 104 units that we are going to build on the mosquito control property. I think there's a lot of, uh, of ways that we can negotiate here and still have a shelter and still build affordable housing. The city also owns other parcels of pro property on College Road, such as where the SPCA is. Um, I know we've talked about um, uh, Bayview and putting the property there, but the county has clearly said no to that. But I think we've got options where we can create uh, a viable, humane uh, cuts for those people who are less fortunate than we are right now. Uh, this is for uh, each of you or both of you. Um, what initiative that you specifically proposed um, and saw through are you proudest of from your time on the commission? Uh, I'll start. And 
it's pretty easy. It's um, uh, residential recycling. Um, one of my biggest disappointments was that the commercial side didn't come right along with that, but that was our first real step in, in being more, more green in Key West. Um, and I know that we've got a number of commissioners out there that are working on bringing the commercial recycling um, uh, along with us so that we can, we can truly be a recycling community. But uh, um, sponsoring and bringing forth residential uh, recycling was my biggest thing. One of the things that I'm very proud of is that I have finally got people listening to the need to preserve the current stock of affordable housing and trying to transfer some of the short-term rentals to affordable housing with a program called Save Our Affordable Rentals. It takes a couple of years to build new housing, and if we can give tax incentives to those who are truly landlords renting affordably and do it as a look back, why shouldn't we capitalize on that effort first and then start doing creative things along the way? There's a, a real quick thing that happened my last time up. I'm very proud of the fact to say that the new ambulance that the city has ordered does have the automatic lift feature to help cut down on workman's compensation claims that a lot of our firefighters are dealing with having to lift some of the patients that have to be lifted into those stretchers. So it's just a small thing of $17,000, but it's gonna make a difference for workman compensation, better services to our customers, our clients, our citizens, and it was, it was the one that everybody voted on unanimously, unanimously with absolutely no debate. Thank you, a question to both of you. Some in Key West see tourism, by far our biggest industry, and quality of life as a binary choice. Visitors versus residents. One defeats the other. Where do you see the balance? Well, first of all, there has to be a, a balance. I think there's a worldwide pushback right now to what I call tourism fatigue. And I think it's very valid. Um, tourism certainly has an impact on residential life in, in a very successful tourism economy, and we are certainly one of those. So I think there has to be a balance. And I think it's really easy to find ways that you take tourism profits and tourism dollars and make sure they're going back to the residents so they can appreciate what we have and how we make our money and how this island survives. But I think it's a relatively simple thing to do. Um, let's improve the streets on some of our tourism dollars. Let's clean our beaches on some of the tourism dollars. Let's take care of our infrastructure based on some of the tourism dollars. And I think then you bridge that gap and, and, and you get the residents who are feeling somewhat ignored right now, uh, understanding how important the tourism is to our island and to our economy. I don't think that tourism and quality of life are mutually exclusive. Yes, tourism play, plays, does play a large part in our economy, but I don't think most people realize that the military also drives more than $300 million to our economy as well. And a lot of military also contribute to the utilization of our hotel rooms when they're down here on temporary duty. As far as the quality of life, some of the tourists have more of an impact than others do, especially those who are renting with the transient short-term rentals in our neighborhoods. We currently do use TDC dollars for some of our infrastructure, and some of our tourist-generated dollars do go to things like the sales tax, the gas tax, and the infrastructure tax, which do, in fact, today, fund some of the improvements we are trying to, to proceed with. Right this year, we have seen a decrease in those funds due to the decrease in tourism following the big event of last year. So some of those funds will not be as readily available. But we do see our tourist dollars being contributed to our economy. We just have to utilize how they have prioritized perhaps a little differently and make sure we communicate, which is one thing I think has not always been a stellar quality of our commissions. We have to communicate to our people. What are we doing and why are we doing it? And always tell you the facts. I'd like to ask this question of both of you. Um, what specific action would you take in your first term of office to reduce traffic and parking congestion across the island? <laughs> okay, we can keep on laughing on 
this one, but it's something that's very pragmatic and very practical. I have sat through multiple of the community meetings and special meetings on the alternative transportation and such. And the first thing I would do is I would make sure that we build that 120 space parking garage that was supposed to be built. Okay, when Terry was a uh, commissioner, we were supposed to have a fire department, city hall, and a parking garage downtown. It would be so practical to put that 120 space garage there. It's on the Duval Loop. We would have employees be able to park in it, take the loop to their destinations downtown. It would preclude the tourists and the locals from driving around and around. They could park there. It would be available for certain parking for the bed and breakfast people that are in that neighborhood. And guess what? It would drive revenue because parking does drive revenue in the city. And we could probably also put something in there that says that could be one of the spaces where the people with residential passes could get their four hour free parking to go downtown. So I think that's one of the first things we would do. It would fit nicely into the plans and that would be the start that I would make. Well, it's a pretty simple project to reduce traffic and congestion and parking issues when you have less cars on the road. I mean, it's just, it's just a simple fact. So what, what do you do to get less cars on the road is you provide alternate forms to get around the city. Those alternate forms to get around the city are by bicycle and to have safe, dedicated bicycle lanes and to have safe sidewalks. I mean, we're, we're a community that draws uh, an, an incredible number of tourists who are all used to biking and walking. I don't know why everybody has to have a car. So we offer them alternative forms. We take that very successful Duval Loop and we add to that to bring our, our working class people into the community without a car or a scooter. And we simply reduce the number of cars that are in Key West. Talking about traffic here. Uh, coming up this Thursday night, DOT has a public meeting at the Marriott Beachside regarding the reconstruction of the Kalki Channel bridges. Beginning in uh, about a year and a half now, they're going to do a $3.2 million project to reconstruct both of those bridges. For 16 months, it's going to be one lane in, one lane out. One lane in, one lane out. I think everybody knows what that means. What can you do to plan for that and accommodate that? You have 16, well, we have a year and a half now before it's going to happen. It's going to be hell. Well, I think one of the things you do, Bill, is you work with the Chamber of Commerce and we start maybe changing some flexible schedules here for people who don't work. Um, I think this is a wonderful time to uh, write share um, because you really truly do not want to be out on the roads un under those conditions. Um, but I think that we work with schedules. I think that we can help people get in at varying times of the day. Uh, but we just prepare to. You know, we got through North Roosevelt Boulevard. It wasn't the most wonderful thing in the world, but we got through it. And that was as major of a construction feat as, as Cal Key Bridge. So I believe we can get through it with some solid, uh, realistic, common sense planning. First thing we have to decide on is what is the message we want to send out. And not only the Chamber of Commerce, but we also have a very active Key West Business Guild. And we have the Attractions Association. We have the Lodging Association. We have to pull together all of the major groups in this town to say, what is your problem going to be with this? We have to define some solutions and do this in enough time that we meet with people with the DOT, though we do have relationships established, and we're going to have to push them even harder on this one to decide what do we want the plan for ingress and egress be for this city, and what times, what demographics and what people do we need to serve, how we're going to do it. And again, the thing we really have to do is communicate with our public, not only here in the city, but those who come to work and play in our city as well. So again, I'm going to stress communication, education, but on the front, involvement by all concerned. This is a question I'd like uh, both of you to address. Is it the city's responsibility to provide or subsidize workforce housing, or is that the responsibility of employers? You know, we're seeing hotels 
selling for half a million dollars a room and up. <laughs> so, and, you know, even with uh, some downturn in the room, there's still pretty high occupancies. I don't think it's the city's responsibility to subsidize housing. I think we have to have careful planning of what's going on and establish what are our true needs. They are, some folks will tell you, oh, we need 3,000 rooms. Well, I never saw the justification of those 3,000 units. Our population has been declining. I do think we need to work to understand just what is the need. And again, I think our focus should be on for, focusing on the affordable, trying to get some of our short-term transient rentals to convert to the workforce housing, and giving incentives to those people who are truly renting affordably. I think if we do that, we can affect even the quality of life of our neighborhoods by not having some of these, and I should we say, rent rentals amongst the families and the neighborhoods that we can call home to. But I do think uh, I would rather see the private sector involved in it. And right now we have plenty of B Pass and Rogo units to go around if those folks would like to come and participate in our town. I would agree with Margaret. I, you know, I don't think it's a primary responsibility of government to provide uh, affordable housing. By the purest form, uh, the responsibility of government is to provide the services for which the people cannot provide themselves, like fire and, and police department and sewer and water and things of that nature. Having said that, however, I don't think the city should be a deterrent. And I, I certainly think that we can help produce affordable housing. The city is the second largest land owner in the city of Key West behind the Navy. And I'm certainly thinking that we can do some public-private partnerships where the city holds onto the land, gives 99-year land leases, so it still stays in, in, in under government control. But, but that's, a, that's the largest deterrent to building affordable housing in the Keys right now is, is the price of land, and particularly in, in Key West. I think that there are lots of things that we can do. First of all, we can streamline our building permit process. Um, it is, it's onerous at best, so that we can make it easier for people to be incentivized to come in and work with the city in order to provide the housing that we need for our labor force right now. Thank you, sir. All right, this, it's 808. We're absolutely in extra innings, but this will be our, our last round, so let's make it count here. Thank you, Todd. Uh, no, 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 understood. Uh, Margaret, uh, uh, Terry, I've got a question I'd like to put to both of you. I've saved my serious, I've saved my serious question for last. Key West seems to be overrun with iguanas. Some of you may like them, others may not. They create traffic snarls, carry pathogens, make a mess, and elbow indigenous species, indigenous critters out of their ecological niche. Ideas? Well, actually, it's interesting you say that because we just um, contacted the iguana hunter. Um, you see that little picture in the uh, citizen? And we had him brought out and we showed him the size of the iguana in our back tree, and we thought he was going to wrap that aluminum around there so that once the iguana came down, you can't get back up. His solution was, well, ma'am, he said, he said, you have neighbors really close to you, and I can't get a clear shot at him. So, um, with that said, we do have too many iguanas. I mean, at times we have too many chickens. And I would love to see a humane way in order to eradicate some of them uh, from the city of Key West. What that is, Matthew, I don't know, but I, I would certainly like to, to do some research and find out what that humane way is, because I know other communities must have done it in the past, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I went to the FWC seminar that was held at the Marriott a few months ago. They have placed a biologist here in the Keys whose specialty this will be. There are ways they can be trapped. They have no natural predators. Um, the thing that you have to do is try to make sure if you want to trap them, if you will, in some of the feral cat traps that some people use, they can then be taken and uh, someone else will dispose of them for you if you trap them. 
lots of red flowers or something and certain fruits that attract them. There are also a group of ladies in town called Iguana Mamas. And they have, <laughs> no joke, and these people are being, uh, they're going to, they are working with the city because in the seminar that I attended, I got a city together with the people at FWC. There is something called, uh, oh, now I'm going to forget the term, but it's called mulch mounds, M-U-L-C-H, M-O-U-N-D-S. And they have found these effective for the iguanas will burrow into these mulch mounds that you can put on your own properties. That's where they lay the eggs. And all you have to do is get the eggs out and flood them out, break the eggs, and they don't hatch. So that's one way of deterring the population. If you don't want to destroy the eggs yourself, put them in a plastic bag and dispose them with your garbage. Feed them to the fish or something. But I think we need to work closer with FWC and again, provide more education, humane ways of trapping them, and we will be disposed of from there. Yeah, I'd like to know, we've gone in about 15 minutes, we've gone from presidential politics, health care, my question is regarding the Navy's presence in town and how that may be um, possibly negatively impacting our housing market. Um, we know that the Navy does not have enough housing on base. We know that they also provide large housing stipends for people that live off base. And then we hear also that the Navy is investing a significant sum of money in some construction project, potentially building a new second fly Navy building. <laughs> Do you think the Navy understands that impact and what can we do better to get them to help with our housing market instead of negatively impacting the cost of housing? I can definitely tell you where they're now, uh, where they're at all. Everybody brings up the housing at 60. They put out a request for, uh, it's not a request for proposals, and the five companies that all came back and said that it was just going to be more effective to tear down those 166 units and totally build in New York's. And that was a decision that came back. I am in close contact with our executive team at the Naval Air Station, who was in touch with Jacksonville, which is where the housing decisions come from. Yes, they are going to be building a second flying Navy building. They are looking at putting additional housing and a new fire station, as well as over $100 million into repairs at the Naval Air Station. They are very concerned. The Navy is not the only one who gives stipends to their employees here in Key West. The grocery chains do it and some of the uh, large suppliers do it here in town. Uh, many times you see two or three people going out and sharing a unit, especially our young single folks, but I do think the Navy is very acutely aware and they are more than willing to work with us. And I will tell you right now, I already have that relationship established with them and we will continue to work on those issues. Well, the short answer is yes, they are responsible and, and shared in our affordable housing issue. Um, they have accentuated the issue by the fact that, that their, um, their service people do not live on base. And I think it is their responsibility to step up to the plate. They've got 18 acres out there. They've allowed 166 units of single family housing to fall into a state of disrepair. So yes, um, they have certainly changed the entire horizon for affordable housing in Key West. As I mentioned, they've got 18 acres to build on out there. They don't abide by any building code. They don't have any density issues. They don't follow any of the same uh, rules and regulations that we have to abide by when we build in the city of Key West. So they are certainly, certainly very right to help us out in that situation. We're a small community and we all need to work together and take responsibilities for our actions or inactions. And I would say that the Navy certainly is responsible responsible for helping us work our way out of this affordable housing situation. I want to say this uh, round has been a lot of fetch compared to the congressional. <laughs> but I, I, I'm interested in knowing your views, each of you. What differentiates you? What separates you? Well, you know, first of all, let me say this, and this is just a, a diversion, Bill, but I don't think you should be in politics unless you can stand up here and run for office on your own laurels and have your own ideas and your own solutions to problems. So when somebody said, you know, why are you different or why are you, 
Margaret and I are, are, are very different. I mean, we approach things differently. It's not to say that it's good or bad or more successful or less successful, but we approach things a little differently. Um, I'm, I'm more of a consensus builder and a, a team builder, and that, that simply comes from sports. I mean, I spent my whole life um, in team sports, and that's the only way I know how to function. Uh, plus, I had three sisters, and we only had one bathroom. So, <laughs> you, you know, you, you learn to live and, and negotiate and accommodate. And, and what's most important to me is that we get there, we get results, everybody, you know, is left whole, and that we accomplish what we set out to accomplish. We've got lots to do in the city of Key West, and we cannot do it by fighting and bickering and disagreeing and standing your ground. We've got to do it by negotiations, by accepting new ideas, by accepting other people's viewpoints, and getting there together and lifting somebody up along the way. This is something Terry and I do have a lot of similarities on. Uh, she talks about consensus building. This is what I did as part of my corporate career, which was to bring people and companies together, whether inside of IBM or two separate companies. The thing was to get people together to discuss it and to find common ground to go forward. Uh, one of the things I was also known for is always coming up with a creative and innovation, innovative solution for things. One of the things that I would do as mayor is to make sure that the community is heard and listened to, and that includes everybody who comes before the podium, as well as everyone who sits in a commission seat. I will strive to make sure that all people are heard so that when we make a decision, as a dais, everyone has spoken, contributed their facts, and make sure that the decisions we make, everyone has contributed to. And I will not handle things the way that some predecessors have done, where various citizens and people on the council were cut off because we did not have thorough discussion so that all of the facts could get out. And it's only when we have those facts that we do what is best for the community. So I pledge to you communication, continued community meetings, continued responsiveness to your emails and your phone calls, and respect for every individual, whether they're on the dais, in the community, or at the podium. Respect and going forward together in a cooperative and innovative manner. Time's up. I really hate to say that you talked about getting cut off. Man, this is the last question of the evening. form of transportation. And uh, it's true, it's a great place to bike in a lot of ways, but it's also one of the most dangerous places in Florida to bike. Um, both my husband and I have been hit by cars <laughs> through no fault of our own while on our bikes. Um, and uh, what specific steps would you take to make this a safer, more bicycle-friendly community? There are being taken, Nancy. We have we have met as a group for about the past year and we have a master bicycle plan coming up uh, in front of the city commission. Um, what will be the real key is if the city commission has the political will in order to pass it. Because any time that you create a master bicycle plan around Key West where we have streets that are 13 feet wide with two-way traffic and parking on both sides, you've got your hands full. So we are going to have to make some very, very difficult decisions to make this happen. But for the first time in Key West, we have a master bicycle plan that uh, connects every single area of Key West with downtown and home safely with a safe five-foot bicycle path. So again, it's going to be seen whether the city commission has the political will to get it done. And we need every one of your support to Talk to your city commission to let them know how important that is to not only the safety of Key West, but the quality of life of our residents and our visitors. Terry is right. There is a master bicycle plan. There are also suggestions that have been brought forward by the Alternative Transportation and Parking Committee. One of the things is not just political will, it's money. And right now, we don't have a lot of money to fund a number of those ideas. 
partially or fully. So we were going to have to prioritize the things that are of key importance. Am I a total bicyclist? No, I sweat too much and I don't like to be sweaty when I get to meetings. But I was known, and some of the folks here from city staff can tell you, I kept a bicycle at City Hall. And whenever I could go to meetings on that bicycle, I rode it during the day. And yes, there are times it's uh, not the safest, but there are also some situations where bicyclists create a good part of the problem by not being stopping at signs, darting out into traffic. So we have a, a couple of prompt efforts to take a look at here. It's not only more bicycle lanes, but we have the skateboarders on the town. We have on our roads. We have people on motorized bicycles on the sidewalk. I think we have a couple of things that we have to address to make our forms of transportation, whether they're bike, foot, car, bus, safer and available to more people. And of course, we do need more enforcement. And for that, I'm going to tell you right now, our law enforcement staff is running short. So if you know some good folks that want to go to the police academy, bring them on because we do need more enforcement people. Pardon me? I could cut you off, but since it's an advertisement for the police department, we're like, what are these young ladies that come here?